You are listening to The Gospel of Matthew from the Passion Translation, narrated by Alyssa Catron. Matthew chapter 1, from Abraham to Christ. This is the scroll of the lineage and birth of Jesus, the Anointed One, the Son of David, and descendant of Abraham. Abraham had a son named Isaac, who had a son named Jacob, who had a son named Judah. He and his brothers became the tribes of Israel. Judah and Tamar had twin sons, Perez and Zerah. Perez had a son named Hezron, who had a son named Ram, who had a son named Amenadab, who had a son named Nashan, who had a son named Salam, who along with Rahab had a son named Boaz. Boaz and Ruth had a son named Obed, who was the father of Jesse. And Jesse had a son named David, who became the king. Then David and Bathsheba had a son named Solomon, who had a son named Rehoboam, who had a son named Abijah, who had a son named Asa, who had a son named Jehoshaphat, who had a son named Joram, who had a son named Uzziah, who had a son named Jotham, who had a son named Ahaz, who had a son named Hezekiah, who had a son named Manasseh, who had a son named Amos, who had a son named Josiah, who was the father of Jeconiah. It was during the days of Jeconiah and his brothers that Israel was taken captive and deported to Babylon. About the time of their captivity in Babylon, Jeconiah had a son named Shealtiel, who had a son named Zerubbabel, who had a son named Abihud, who had a son named Eliakim, who had a son named Azor, who had a son named Zadok, who had a son named Achim, who had a son named Eliud, who had a son named Eliezer, who had a son named Mathen, who had a son named Jacob, who was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was called the Anointed One. So from Abraham to David were fourteen generations, and from David to the Babylonian captivity, fourteen generations, and from the Babylonian captivity to Christ, fourteen generations. An angel comes to Joseph. This was how Jesus, God's anointed one, was born. His mother Mary had promised Joseph to be his wife, but while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Her fiancé, Joseph, was a righteous man, full of integrity, and he didn't want to disgrace her. But when he learned of her pregnancy, he secretly planned to break the engagement. While he was still debating with himself about what to do, he fell asleep and had a supernatural dream. An angel from the Lord appeared to him in clear light and said, Joseph, descendant of David, don't hesitate to take Mary into your home as your wife because the power of the Holy Spirit has conceived a child in her womb. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Savior, for he is destined to give his life to save his people from their sins. This happened so that what the Lord spoke through his prophet would come true. Listen, a virgin will be pregnant, she will give birth to a son, and he will be known as Emmanuel, which means in Hebrew, God became one of us. When Joseph awoke from his dream, he did all that the angel of the Lord instructed him to do. He took Mary to be his wife, but they refrained from having sex until she gave birth to her son, whom they named Jesus. Matthew chapter 2 The Wise Men Visit Jesus was born in Bethlehem, near Jerusalem, during the reign of King Herod. After Jesus' birth, a group of spiritual priests from the east came to Jerusalem and inquired of the people, 
Where is the child who was born king of the Jewish people? We observed his star rising in the sky, and we've come to bow before him in worship. King Herod was shaken to the core when he heard this. Not only him, but all of Jerusalem was disturbed when they heard this news. So he called a meeting of the Jewish ruling priests and religious scholars, demanding that they tell him where the promised Messiah was prophesied to be born. He will be born in Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, they told him, because the prophecy states, And you, little Bethlehem, are not insignificant among the clans of Judah, for out of you will emerge the shepherd king of my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the spiritual priests from the east to ascertain the exact time the star first appeared. And he told them, Now go to Bethlehem, and carefully look there for the child. And when you found him, report to me, so that I can go and bow down and worship him too. And so they left, and on their way to Bethlehem, suddenly the same star they had seen in the east reappeared. Amazed, they watched as it went ahead of them, and stopped directly over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were so ecstatic that they shouted and celebrated with unrestrained joy. When they came into the house and saw the young child with Mary, his mother, they were overcome. Falling to the ground at his feet, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure boxes full of gifts and presented him with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Afterward, they returned to their own country by another route, because God had warned them in a dream not to go back to Herod. They escaped to Egypt. After they had gone, Joseph had another dream. An angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Get up now and flee to Egypt. Take Mary and the little child, and stay there until I tell you to leave, for Herod intends to search for the child to kill him. So the very next night he got up and took Jesus and his mother and made their escape to Egypt, and remained there until Herod died. All of this fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through his prophet. I summon my son out of Egypt. When Herod realized that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. So he sent soldiers with orders to slaughter every baby boy two years old and younger in Bethlehem and throughout the surrounding countryside based on the time frame he was given from interrogating the wise men. This fulfilled the words of the prophet Jeremiah. I hear the screams of anguish, weeping and wailing in Ramah, Rachel is weeping uncontrollably for her children, and she refuses to be comforted because they are all dead and gone. They return to Nazareth. After Herod died, the angel of the Lord appeared again to Joseph in a dream while he was still in Egypt, saying, Go back to the land of Israel and take the child and his mother with you, for those who sought to kill the child are dead. So he awoke and took Jesus and Mary and returned to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus, Herod's son, had succeeded him as a ruler over all the territory of Judah, he was afraid to go back. Then he had another dream from God, warning him to avoid that region and instructing him instead to go to the province of Galilee. So he settled his family in the village of Nazareth fulfilling the prophecy that he would be known as Branch. Matthew chapter 3 John the Baptizer It was at this time that John the Baptizer began to preach in the desert of Judah. His message was this, The realm of heaven's kingdom is about to appear, so you'd better keep turning away from evil and turn back to God. Isaiah was referring to John when he prophesied, A thunderous voice, 
one who will be crying out in the wilderness, prepare yourself for the Lord's coming and level a straight path inside your hearts for him. Now, John wore clothing made from camel's hair, tied at his waist with a leather strap, and his food consisted of dried locusts and wild honey. A steady stream of people from Jerusalem, all the surrounding countryside, and the region near the Jordan came out to the wilderness to be baptized by him. And while they were publicly confessing their sins, he would immerse them in the Jordan River. But when he saw many coming from among the wealthy elite of Jewish society, and many of the religious leaders known as Pharisees coming to witness the baptism, he began to denounce them, saying, You offspring of vipers! Who warned you to slither away like snakes from the fire of God's judgment? You must prove your repentance by a changed life. And don't presume you can get away with merely saying to yourselves, But we're Abraham's descendants. For I tell you, God can awaken these stones to become sons of Abraham. The axe is now ready to cut down the trees at their very roots. Every fruitless, rotten tree will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. Those who repent I baptize with water. But there is coming a man after me who is more powerful than I am. In fact, I am not even worthy enough to pick up his sandals. He will submerge you into union with the spirit of holiness and with a raging fire. He comes with a winnowing fork in his hands and comes to his threshing floor to sift what is worthless from what is pure. And he is ready to sweep out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his granary. But the straw he will burn up with a fire that cannot be extinguished. Then Jesus left Galilee to come to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But when he waded into the water, John resisted him, saying, Why are you doing this? I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you, and yet you come to be baptized by me? Jesus replied, It is only right to do all that God requires. Then John baptized Jesus. And as Jesus rose up out of the water, the heavenly realm opened up over him, and he saw the Holy Spirit descend out of the heavens and rest upon him in the form of a dove. Then suddenly, the voice of the Father shouted from the sky, saying, This is the Son I love, and my greatest delight is in Him. Matthew chapter 4 Jesus tempted by the devil Afterward, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the lonely wilderness in order to reveal His strength against the accuser, by going through the ordeal of testing. And after fasting for forty days, Jesus was extremely weak and famished. Then the tempter came to entice him to provide food by doing a miracle. So he said to Jesus, How can you possibly be the Son of God and go hungry? Just order these stones to be turned into loaves of bread. He answered, The scriptures say, Bread alone will not satisfy, but true life is found in every word which constantly goes forth from God's mouth. Then the accuser transported Jesus to the holy city of Jerusalem, and perched him at the highest point of the temple, and said to him, If you're really God's son, jump, and the angels will catch you, for it is written in scriptures, he will command his angels to protect you, and they will lift you up, so that you won't even bruise your foot on a rock. Once again, Jesus said to him, The scriptures say, You must never put the Lord your God to a test. And the third time, the accuser lifted Jesus up into a very high mountain range, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all the splendor that goes with it. All these kingdoms I will give to you, the accuser said, if only you will kneel down before me and worship me. But Jesus said, Go away, 
enemy. For the scriptures say, Kneel before the Lord your God and worship only him. At once the accuser left him, and angels suddenly gathered around Jesus to minister to his needs. Jesus preaches in Galilee. When Jesus heard that John the baptizer had been thrown into prison, he went back into Galilee. Jesus moved from Nazareth to make his home in Capernaum, which is by Lake Galilee and the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. He did this to make the prophecy of Isaiah come true. Listen, you who live in the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, along the road to the sea and on the other side of the Jordan, and Galilee, the land of non-Jewish peoples. You who spend your days shrouded in darkness can now say, We have seen a brilliant light. And those who live in the dark shadow land of death can now say, The dawning light arises on us. From that time on, Jesus began to proclaim his message with these words, Keep turning away from your sins and come back to God, for heaven's kingdom realm is now accessible. Jesus calls his disciples. As he was walking by the shore of Lake Galilee, Jesus noticed two fishermen who were brothers. One was named Kepha, later called Peter, and the other was Andrew, his brother. Watching as they were casting their nets into the water, Jesus called out to them and said, Come and follow me, and I will transform you into men who catch people for God. Immediately they dropped their nets and left everything behind to follow Jesus. Leaving there, Jesus found three other men sitting in a boat, mending their nets. Two were brothers, Jacob and John, and they were with their father, Zebedee. Jesus called Jacob and John to his side and said to them, Come and follow me. And at once they left their boat and their father and began to follow Jesus. Jesus' Ministry of Healing Jesus ministered from place to place throughout all the province of Galilee. He taught in the synagogues, preaching the hope of the kingdom realm and healing every kind of sickness and disease among the people. His fame spread everywhere. Many people who were in pain and suffering with every kind of illness were brought to Jesus for their healing. Epileptics, paralytics, and those tormented by demonic forces were all set free. Everyone who was brought to Jesus was healed. This resulted in massive crowds of people following him, including people from Galilee, Jerusalem, the land of Judah, the region of the ten cities known as the Decapolis, and beyond the Jordan River. Matthew chapter 5 Jesus' Sermon on the Hillside One day, Jesus saw a vast crowd of people gathering to hear him, so he went up the slope of a hill and sat down, with his followers and disciples spread over the hillside, and Jesus began to teach them. What wealth is offered to you when you fill your spiritual poverty? For there is no charge to enter the realm of heaven's kingdom. What delight comes to you when you wait upon the Lord? For you will find what you long for. What blessing comes to you when gentleness lives in you? For you will inherit the earth. How enriched you are when you crave righteousness, for you will be surrounded with fruitfulness. How satisfied you are when you demonstrate tender mercy, for tender mercy will be demonstrated to you. What bliss you experience when your heart is pure for then your eyes will open to see more and more of God. How blessed you are when you make peace, for then you will be recognized as true children of God. How enriched you are when you bear the wounds of being persecuted for doing what is right. 
for that is when you experience the realm of heaven's kingdom. How ecstatic you can be when people insult and persecute you and speak all kinds of cruel lies about you because of your love for me. So leap for joy, since your heavenly reward is great. For you are being rejected the same way the prophets were before you. Your lives are like salt among the people. But if you, like salt, become bland, how can your saltiness be restored? Flavorless salt is good for nothing and will be thrown out and trampled on by others. Your lives light up the world. Let others see your light from a distance, for how can you hide a city that stands on a hilltop? And who would light a lamp and then hide it in an obscure place? Instead, it's placed where everyone in the house can benefit from its light. So don't hide your light. Let it shine brightly before others, so that the commendable things you do will shine as light upon them and then they will give their praise to your Father in heaven. Fulfillment of the Law If you think I've come to set aside the Law of Moses or the writings of the prophets, you're mistaken. I have come to fulfill and bring to perfection all that has been written. Indeed, I assure you, as long as heaven and earth endure, not even the smallest detail of the law will be done away with until its purpose is complete. So whoever violates even the least important of the commandments and teaches others to do so will be the least esteemed in the realm of heaven's kingdom. But whoever obeys them and teaches their truths to others will be greatly esteemed in the realm of heaven's kingdom. For I tell you, Unless your lives are more pure and full of integrity than the religious scholars and the Pharisees, you will never experience the realm of heaven's kingdom. Anger You're familiar with the commandment that the older generation was taught. Do not murder or you will be judged. But I am telling you, if you hold anger in your heart toward a fellow believer, you are subject to judgment. And whoever demeans and insults a fellow believer is answerable to the congregation. And whoever calls down curses upon a fellow believer is in danger of being sent to a fiery hell. So then, if you are presenting a gift before the altar in the temple, and suddenly you remember a quarrel you have with a fellow believer, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go at once to apologize with the one who is offended. Then after you have reconciled, come to the altar and present your gift. It is always better to come to terms with the one who wants to sue you before you go to trial, or you may be found guilty by the judge and he will hand you over to the officers who will throw you into prison. Believe me, you won't get out of prison until you've paid the full amount. Adultery. Your ancestors have been taught, never commit adultery. However, I say to you, if you look with lust in your eyes at the body of a woman who is not your wife, you've already committed adultery in your heart. If your right eye seduces you to fall into sin, then go blind in your right eye. For you're better off losing sight in one eye than to have your whole body thrown into hell. And if your right hand entices you to sin, let it go limp and useless. For you're better off losing a part of your body than to have it all thrown into hell. It has been said, whoever divorces his wife must give her legal divorce papers. However, I say to you, if anyone divorces his wife for any reason except for infidelity, he causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Making Oaths Again, your ancestors were taught, never swear an oath that you don't intend to keep, but keep your vows to the Lord God. However, I say to you, don't bind yourself by taking an oath at all. Don't swear by heaven, 
for heaven is where God's throne is placed. Don't swear an oath by the earth, because it's the rug under God's feet, and not by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. And why would you swear by your own head? Because it's not in your power to turn a single hair white or black. But just let your words ring true. A simple yes or no will suffice. Anything beyond this springs from a deceiver. Your ancestors have also been taught. Take an eye in exchange for an eye, and a tooth in exchange for a tooth. However, I say to you, don't repay an evil act with another evil act. But whoever insults you by slapping you on the right cheek, turn the other to him as well. If someone is determined to sue you for your coat, give him the shirt off your back as a gift in return. And should people in authority take advantage of you, do more than what they demand. Learn to generously share what you have with those who ask for help, and don't close your heart to the one who comes to borrow from you. Love your enemies. Your ancestors have also been taught, love your neighbors and hate the one who hates you. However, I say to you, love your enemy, bless the one who curses you, and do something wonderful for the one who hates you, and respond to the very ones who persecute you by praying for them. For that will reveal your identity as children of your Heavenly Father. He is kind to all by bringing the sun to warm and rainfall to refresh whether a person does what is good or evil. What reward do you deserve if you only love the lovable? Don't even the tax collectors do that? How are you any different from others if you limit your kindness only to your friends? Don't even the ungodly do that? Since you are children of a perfect Father in heaven, you are to be perfect like Him. Matthew chapter 6 Giving with Pure Motives Examine your motives to make sure you're not showing off when you do your good deeds, only to be admired by others. Otherwise, you will lose the reward of your Heavenly Father. So when you give to the poor, don't announce it and make a show of it just to be seen by people, like the hypocrites in the streets and in the marketplace. They've already received their reward. But when you demonstrate generosity, do it with pure motives and without drawing attention to yourself. Give secretly and your Father who sees all you do will reward you openly. Prayer Whenever you pray, be sincere and not like the pretenders who love the attention they receive when praying before others in the meetings and on street corners. Believe me, they've already received in full their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your innermost chamber and be alone with Father God, praying to Him in secret. And your Father, who sees all you do, will reward you openly. When you pray, there is no need to repeat empty phrases, praying like those who don't know God, for they expect God to hear them because of their many words. There is no need to imitate them, since your Father already knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this, Our Father, dwelling in the heavenly realms, may the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. Manifest your kingdom realm and cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth just as it is fulfilled in heaven. We acknowledge you as our provider of all we need each day. Forgive us the wrongs we have done as we ourselves release forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Rescue us every time we face tribulation and set us free from evil for you are the King who rules with power and glory forever. Amen. And when you pray, make sure you forgive the faults of others so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you. But if you withhold forgiveness from others, your Father withholds forgiveness from you. 
Fasting. When you fast, don't look like those who pretend to be spiritual. They want everyone to know they're fasting, so they appear in public looking miserable, gloomy, and disheveled. Believe me, they've already received their reward in full. When you fast, don't let it be obvious, but instead, wash your face and groom yourself. And realize that your father in this secret place is the one who is watching all that you do in secret and will continue to reward you openly. Treasures in Heaven Don't keep hoarding for yourselves earthly treasures that can be stolen by thieves. Material wealth eventually rusts, decays, and loses its value. Instead, Stockpile heavenly treasures for yourselves that cannot be stolen and will never rest, decay, or lose their value. For your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. The eyes of your spirit allow revelation light to, to enter into your being. If your heart is unclouded, the light floods in. But if your eyes are focused on money, the light cannot penetrate and darkness takes its place. How profound will be the darkness within you if the light of truth cannot enter? How could you worship two gods at the same time? You will have to hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't worship the true God while enslaved to the God of money. Don't worry. This is why I tell you to never be worried about your life, for all that you need will be provided, such as food, water, clothing, everything your body needs. Isn't there more to your life than a meal? Isn't your body more than clothing? Look at all the birds. Do you think they worry about their existence? They don't plant or reap or store up food, yet your Heavenly Father provides them each with food. Aren't you much more valuable to your father than they? So which one of you by worrying could add anything to your life? And why would you worry about your clothing? Look at all the beautiful flowers of the field. They don't work or toil, and yet not even Solomon in all his splendor was robed in beauty more than one of these. So if God has clothed the meadow with hay, which is here for such a short time and then dried up and burned, won't he provide for you the clothes you need, even though you live with such little faith? So then, forsake your worries. Why would you say, what will we eat? Or, what will we drink? Or, what will we wear? For that is what the unbelievers chase after. Doesn't your Heavenly Father already know the things your bodies require? So above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from Him. Then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. Refuse to worry about tomorrow, but deal with each challenge that comes your way one day at a time. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Matthew chapter 7 Do not judge. Refuse to be a critic full of bias toward others, and judgment will not be passed on you, for you'll be judged by the same standard that you've used to judge others. The measurement you use on them will be used on you. Why would you focus on the flaw in someone else's life and yet fail to notice the glaring flaws of your own? How could you say to your friend, let me show you where you're wrong, when you're guilty of even more? You're being hypercritical and a hypocrite. First acknowledge your own blind spots and deal with them. And then you'll be capable of dealing with the blind spots of your friend. Who would hang earrings on a dog's ear or throw pearls in front of wild pigs? They'll only trample them under their feet and then turn around and tear you to pieces. Ask, and the gift is yours. Seek, and you'll discover. Knock, 
and the door will be opened for you. For every persistent one will get what he asks for. Every persistent seeker will discover what he longs for, and everyone who knocks persistently will one day find an open door. Do you know of any parent who would give his hungry child who asked for food a plate of rocks instead? Or when asked for a piece of fish, what parent would offer his child a snake instead? If you, imperfect as you are, know how to lovingly take care of your children and give them what's best, how much more ready is your Heavenly Father to give wonderful gifts to them who ask Him? The Golden Rule In everything you do, be careful to treat others in the same way you'd want them to treat you, for that is the essence of all the teachings of the Law and the Prophets. The narrow gate. Come to God through the narrow gate, because the wide gate and broad path is the way that leads to destruction. Nearly everyone chooses that crowded road. The narrow gate and the difficult way leads to eternal life. So few even find it. False prophets. Constantly be on your guard against phony prophets. They come disguised as lambs, appearing to be genuine, but on the inside they are like wild, ravenous wolves. You can spot them by their actions, for the fruit of their character will be obvious. You won't find sweet grapes hanging on a thorn bush, and you'll never pick good fruit from a tumbleweed. So if the tree is good, it will produce good fruit, but if the tree is bad, it will only bear rotten fruit, and it deserves to be cut down and burned. Look at the obvious fruit of their lives and ministries, and then you'll know whether they are true or false. Jesus warns of pretenders. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the realm of heaven's kingdom. It is only those who persist in doing the will of my Heavenly Father. On the day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, don't you remember us? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons and do many miracles for the sake of your name? But I will have to say to them, Go away from me, you lawless rebels. I've never been joined to you. Everyone who hears my teaching and applies it to his life can be compared to a wise man who built his house on an unshakable foundation. When the rains fell and the flood came, with fierce winds beating upon his house, it stood firm because of its strong foundation. But everyone who hears my teaching and does not apply it to his life can be compared to a foolish man who built his house on sand. When it rained and rained and the flood came, with wind and waves beating upon his house, it collapsed and was swept away. By the time Jesus finished speaking, the crowds were dazed and overwhelmed by his teaching, because his words carried such great authority, quite unlike the religious scholars. Matthew chapter 8 Jesus heals a leper After he came down from teaching on the hillside, massive crowds began to follow him. Suddenly, a leper walked up to Jesus and threw himself down before him in worship and said, Lord, you have the power to heal me, if you really want to. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the leper and said, of course I want to heal you. Be healed. And instantly, all signs of leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus said to him, Don't speak to anyone, but go at once and find a priest and show him what has happened to you. Make sure to take the offering Moses commanded so they can certify your healing. Jesus heals the son of a Roman officer. When Jesus entered a village of Capernaum, 
a captain in the Roman army approached him, asking for a miracle. Lord, he said, I have a son who is lying in my home, paralyzed and suffering terribly. Jesus responded, I will go with you and heal him. But the Roman officer interjected, Lord, who am I to have you come into my house? I understand your authority, for I too am a man who walks under authority and have authority over soldiers who serve under me. I can tell one to go and he'll go, and another to come and he'll come. I order my servants and they'll do whatever I ask. So I know that all you need to do is stand here and command healing over my son, and he will be instantly healed. Jesus was astonished when he heard this and said to those who were following him, He has greater faith than anyone I've encountered in Israel. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. Multitudes of non-Jewish people will stream from the east and the west to enter into the banqueting feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the heavenly kingdom. But many Israelites, born to be heirs of the kingdom, will be turned away and banished into the darkness, where there will be bitter weeping and unbearable anguish. Then Jesus turned to the Roman officer and said, Go home. All that you have believed for will be done for you. And his son was healed at that very moment. Jesus heals everyone in Capernaum. Then Jesus went into Peter's home and found Peter's mother-in-law, bedridden, severely ill with a fever. The moment Jesus touched her hand, she was healed. Immediately she got up and began to make dinner for them. That evening, the people brought to him many who were demonized, and by Jesus only speaking a word of healing over them, they were totally set free from their torment, and everyone who was sick received their healing. In doing this, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. He put upon himself our weaknesses, and he carried away our diseases and made us well. At the sight of large crowds gathering around him, Jesus gave orders to his disciples to get ready to sail back over to the other side of the lake. Just then, a religious scholar approached him and said, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no true home in this world. Then another man spoke up and said, Lord, I'll follow you, but first I must take care of my aged father and bury him when he dies. But Jesus said to him, Now is the time to follow me, and let those who are dead bury their own dead. Jesus calms a storm. They all got into a boat and began to cross over to the other side of the lake, and Jesus exhausted, fell asleep. Suddenly, a violent storm developed with waves so high the, the boat was about to be swamped. Yet Jesus continued to sleep soundly. The disciples woke him up saying, Save us, Lord! We're going to die! But Jesus reprimanded them. Why are you so gripped with fear? Where is your faith? Then he stood up and rebuked the storm and said, Be still! And instantly he became perfectly calm. The disciples were astonished by this miracle and said to one another, Who is this man? Even the wind and waves obey his word. Jesus sets free two demonized men. When they arrived on the other side of the lake, in the region of the Gadarenes, two demonized men confronted Jesus. They lived among the tombs of a cemetery and were considered so extremely violent that no one felt safe passing through that area. The demons screamed at Jesus, shouting, 
Son of God, what do you want with us? Leave us alone. Have you come to torment us before the appointed time? There was a large herd of pigs feeding nearby. So the demons pleaded, If you can cast us out, send us into that herd of pigs. Jesus commanded, Then go. And at once the demons came out of the men and went into the pigs. Then the entire herd of crazed pigs stamped down the steep slope and fell into the water and drowned. The men who were herding the pigs fled to the nearby town and informed the people of all that had happened to the demonized men. Then everyone from the town went out to confront Jesus and urged him to go away and leave them alone. Matthew chapter 9 Forgiveness and Healing Jesus got into the boat and returned to what was considered his hometown, Capernaum. Just then, some people brought a paraplegic man to him, lying on a sleeping mat. When Jesus perceived the strong faith within their hearts, he said to the paralyzed man, My son, be encouraged, for your sins have been forgiven. These words prompted some of the religious scholars who were present to think, why, that's nothing but blasphemy. Jesus supernaturally perceived their thoughts and said to them, Why do you carry such evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or Stand up and walk. But now, to convince you that the Son of Man has been given authority to forgive sins, I say to this man, Stand up, Pick up your mat and walk home. Immediately, the man sprang to his feet and left for home. When the crowds witnessed this miracle, they were awestruck. They shouted praises to God because he had given such authority to human beings. Jesus calls Matthew to follow him. As Jesus left Capernaum, he came upon a tax collecting station where a traitorous Jew was busy at his work collecting taxes for the Romans. His name was Matthew. Come, follow me, Jesus said to him. Immediately, Matthew jumped up and began to follow Jesus. Later, Jesus went to Matthew's home to share a meal with him Many other tax collectors and outcasts of society were invited to eat with Jesus and his disciples. When those known as the Pharisees saw what was happening, they were indignant and they kept asking Jesus' disciples, Why would your master dine with such low lives? When Jesus overheard this, he spoke up and said, Healthy people don't need to see a doctor but the sick will go for treatment. Then he added, Now, you should go and study the meaning of the verse, I want you to show mercy, not just offer me a sacrifice. For I have come to invite the outcasts of society and sinners, not those who think they already are on the right path. Jesus brings a new reality. The disciples of John the Baptizer approached Jesus with this question. Why is it that we and the Pharisees fast regularly, but not your disciples? Jesus replied, How can the sons of the bridal chamber grieve when the bridegroom is next to them? But the days of fasting will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. And who would men worn out clothing with new fabric? When the new cloth shrinks, it will rip, making the whole worse than before. And who would pour fresh new wine into an old wineskin? Eventually the wine will ferment and make the wineskin burst, losing everything. The wine is spilled and the wineskin ruined. Instead, new wine is always poured into a new wineskin so that both are preserved. Jesus heals and raises the dead. While Jesus was still speaking, an influential Jewish leader approached and knelt before him, saying, Help me! 
My daughter has just died. Please, come and place your hand upon her so that she will live again. So Jesus and his disciples got up and went with him. Suddenly, a woman came from behind Jesus and touched the tassel of his prayer shawl for healing. She had been suffering from continual bleeding for twelve years, but had faith that Jesus could heal her. For she kept saying to herself, If I could only touch his prayer shawl, I would be healed. Just then, Jesus turned around and looked at her and said, My daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has healed you. And instantly, she was healed. When Jesus finally entered the home of the Jewish leader, he saw a noisy crowd of mourners wailing and playing a funeral dirge on their flutes. He told them, You must leave, for the little girl is not dead. She's only asleep. Then everyone began to ridicule him. After he made the crowd go outside, he went into the girl's room and gently took hold of her hand. She immediately stood to her feet, and the news of this incredible miracle spread everywhere. Jesus opens blind eyes. As Jesus left the house, two blind men began following him, shouting out over and over, Son of David, show us mercy and heal us. And they followed him right into the house where Jesus was staying. So Jesus asked them, Do you believe that I have the power to restore sight to your eyes? They replied, Yes, Lord, we believe. Then Jesus put his hands over their eyes and said, you will have what your faith expects. And instantly, their eyes were opened. They could see. Then Jesus warned them sternly, Make sure that you tell no one what just happened. But unable to contain themselves, they went out and spread the news everywhere. Jesus heals the mute. While they were leaving, some people brought before Jesus a man with a demon spirit who couldn't speak. Jesus cast the demon out of him, and immediately the man began to speak plainly. The crowds marveled in astonishment, saying, We've never seen miracles like this in Israel. But the Pharisees kept saying, The chief of demons is helping him drive out demons. Workers for the Harvest Jesus walked throughout the region with the joyful message of God's kingdom realm. He taught in their meeting houses, and wherever he went, he demonstrated God's power by healing every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the vast crowds of people, Jesus' heart was deeply moved with compassion, because they seemed weary and helpless, like wandering sheep without a shepherd. He turned to his disciples and said, the harvest is ripe and huge, but there are not enough harvesters to bring it all in. As you go, plead with the owner of the harvest to thrust out many more reapers to harvest his grain. Matthew chapter 10 Jesus sends out his twelve apostles. Jesus gathered his twelve disciples and imparted to them authority to cast out demons and to heal every sickness and every disease. Now, these are the names of the first twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is nicknamed Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and then Jacob and John, sons of Zebedee. Next were Philip and Bartholomew, then Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, Jacob, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the former member of the Zealot Party, and Judas, the locksmith, who eventually betrayed Jesus. Jesus commissioned these twelve to go out into the ripened harvest fields with these instructions. Don't go into any non-Jewish or Samaritan territory. Go instead and find the lost sheep among the people of Israel. 
And as you go, preach this message. Heaven's kingdom realm is accessible, close enough to touch. You must continually bring healing to lepers and to those who are sick and make it your habit to break off the demonic presence from people and raise the dead back to life. Freely you have received the power of the kingdom, so freely release it to others. You won't need a lot of money. Travel light and don't even pack an extra change of clothes in your backpack. Trust God for everything because the one who works for him deserves to be provided for. Whatever village or town you enter, search for a godly man who will let you into his home until you leave for the next town. Once you enter a house, speak to the family there and say, God's blessing of peace be upon this house. And if those living there welcome you, let your peace come upon the house. But if you are rejected, that blessing of peace will come back upon you. And if anyone doesn't listen to you and rejects your message, when you leave that town or house, shake the dust off your feet as a prophetic act that you will not take their defilement with you. Mark my words. On the day of judgment, the wicked people who lived in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah will have a lesser degree of punishment than the city that rejects you. For the people of Sodom and Gomorrah did not have the opportunity that was given to them. Now remember, it is I who send you out. Even though you feel vulnerable as lambs going into a pack of wolves, so be as shrewd as snakes, yet as harmless as doves. Jesus warns his apostles of persecution. Be on your guard, for there will be those who will betray you before the religious councils and brutally beat you with whips in their public gatherings. And because you follow me, they will take you to stand trial in front of rulers and even kings as an opportunity to testify of me before them and the unbelievers. So when they arrest you, don't worry about how to speak or what to say, for the Holy Spirit will give you at that very moment the words to speak. It won't be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father repeatedly speaking through you. A brother will betray his brother unto death, even a father his child. Children will rise up against their parents and have them put to death. Expect to be hated by all because of my name, but be faithful to the end and you will experience life and deliverance. And when they persecute you in one town, flee to another. But I promise you this, you will not deliver all the cities and towns of Israel until the Son of Man will have made his appearance. A student is not superior to his teacher any more than a servant would be greater than his master. The student must be satisfied to share his teacher's fate and the servant his master's. If they have called the head of the family Lord of Flies, no wonder they malign the members of his family. Don't be afraid or intimidated by others, for God will bring everything out into the open and every secret will be told. What I say to you in the dark, repeat in broad daylight, and what you hear in a whisper, announce it publicly. Don't be afraid of those who can kill only the body but not your soul. Fear only God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You can buy two sparrows for only a copper coin, yet not even one sparrow falls from its nest without the knowledge of your father. Aren't you worth much more to God than many sparrows? So don't worry, for your father cares deeply about even the smallest detail of your life. If you openly and publicly acknowledge me, I will freely and openly acknowledge you before my heavenly father. But if you publicly deny that you know me, I will also deny you before my Heavenly Father. Perhaps you think I've come to spread peace and calm over the earth, but my coming will bring conflict and vision, not peace. Because of me, 
A son will turn against his father, a daughter against her mother, and against her mother-in-law. Within your own families you will find enemies. Whoever loves father or mother or son or daughter more than me is not fit to be my disciple. And whoever comes to me must follow in my steps and be willing to share my cross and experience it as his own, or he cannot be considered to be my disciple. All who seek to live apart from me will lose it all. But those who let go of their lives for my sake and surrender it all to me will discover true life. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet because he is God's messenger will share a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a good and godly man because he follows me will also share in his reward. And whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of my humble disciples, I promise you, he will not go unrewarded. Matthew chapter 11 Jesus and John the Baptizer After Jesus finished giving instructions to his twelve disciples, he went on to minister in different villages throughout the region. Now, while John the baptizer was in prison, he heard about what Christ was doing among the people. So he sent his disciples to ask him this question. Are you really the one prophesied would come, or should we wait for another? Jesus answered them, Give John this report. The blind see again. The crippled walk, lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised back to life, and the poor and broken now hear of the hope of salvation. And tell John that the blessing of heaven comes upon those who never lose their faith in me, no matter what happens. As they were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What kind of man did you see when you went out into the wilderness? Did you expect to see a man who would be easily intimidated? Who was he? Did you expect to see a man decked out in the splendid fashion of the day? Those who wear fancy clothes live like kings in palaces. Or did you encounter a true prophet out in the lonely, lonely wilderness? Yes, John was a prophet like those of the past, but he is even more than that. He was the fulfillment of this scripture. See, I am sending my prophetic messenger who will go ahead of me and prepare hearts to receive me. For I tell you the truth, throughout history, there has never been a man who surpasses John the baptizer. Yet the least of those who now experience heaven's kingdom realm will become even greater than he. From the moment John stepped onto the scene until now, the realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth and passionate people have taken hold of its power. For all the prophets and the Torah prophesied until John appeared. If you can receive this truth, John is the Elijah who is destined to come. So listen and understand what I am telling you. Don't you understand? How could I describe the people of this generation? You're like children playing great games on the playground, yelling at their playmates. You don't like it when we want to play wedding, and you don't like it when we want to play funeral. You will neither dance nor mourn. Why is it that when John came to you, neither fasting nor drinking wine, you said, he has a demon in him? Yet when the Son of Man came and went to feasts and drank wine, you said, Look at this man. He's nothing but a glutton and a drunkard. He spends all his time with tax collectors and other affluent sinners. But God's wisdom will be visibly seen living in those who embrace it. Jesus criticizes unrepentant cities. Then Jesus began to openly denounce the cities where he had done most of his mighty miracles because the people failed to turn away from sin and return to God. He said, 
how tragic it will be for the city of Croatian, and how horrible for the city of Bethsaida. For if the powerful miracles that I performed in Croatian and Bethsaida had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have humbled themselves and repented and turned from their sins. Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. And Capernaum, do you really think you'll be exalted because of the great miracles I have done there? No! You'll be brought down to the depths of hell because of your rejection of me. For if the miracles I worked in your streets were done in Sodom, it would still be standing today. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for the region of Sodom in the day of judgment than it will be for you. Jesus invites everyone to come. Then Jesus exclaimed, Father, thank you. For you are Lord, the supreme ruler over heaven and earth. And you have hidden the great revelation of your authority from those who are proud and wise in their own eyes. Instead, you have shared it with these who humble themselves. Yes, Father, your plan delights your heart as you've chosen this way to extend your kingdom by giving it to those who have become like trusting children. You have entrusted me with all that you are and all that you have. No one fully and intimately knows the Son except the Father. And no one fully and intimately knows the Father except the Son. But the Son is able to unveil the Father to anyone he chooses. Are you weary, carrying a heavy burden? Then come to me. I will refresh your life. For I am your oasis. Simply join your life with mine. Learn my ways and you'll discover that I am gentle, humble, and easy to please. You will find refreshment and rest in me. For all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. Matthew chapter 12 Jesus, Lord over the Sabbath one Saturday, on the day of rest, Jesus and his disciples were walking through a field of wheat. The disciples were hungry, so they plucked off some heads of grain and rubbed them in their hands to eat. But when some of the Pharisees saw what was happening, they said to him, Look, your disciples shouldn't be harvesting grain on a Sabbath. Jesus responded, haven't you ever read what a King David and his men did when they were hungry? They entered the house of God and ate the sacred bread of God's presence, violating the law by eating bread that only the priests were allowed to eat. And haven't you read in the Torah that the priests violated the rules of the Sabbath by carrying out their duties in the temple on a Saturday, and yet they are without blame? But I say to you, there is one here who is even greater than the temple. If only you could learn the meaning of the words, I want compassion more than a sacrifice, you wouldn't be condemning my innocent disciples. For the Son of Man exercises his lordship over the Sabbath. Then Jesus left them and went into the synagogue where he encountered a man who had an atrophied, paralyzed hand. The fault-finding Pharisees asked Jesus, Is it permissible to perform a work of healing on the Sabbath when no one is supposed to work? They only asked him this question because they hoped to accuse him of breaking the Jewish laws. He answered them, If any of you had a lamb that fell into a ditch on the Sabbath, wouldn't you reach out your hand and lift it out? Isn't a man much more valuable than a lamb? So of course, it's always proper to do miracles, even on the Sabbath. Then he turned to the man and said, Hold out your hand. And as he stretched it out, it was restored exactly like the other. Immediately, the Pharisees went out and started to scheme about how they would do away with him. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he left by another way. 
Massive crowds followed him from there, and he healed all who were sick. However, he sternly warned them not to tell others or disclose his real identity in order to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. Take a careful look at my servant, my chosen one. I love him dearly, and I find all my delight in him. I will breathe my spirit upon him, and he will decree justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or be found yelling in public. He won't brush aside the bruised and broken. He will be gentle with the weak and feeble until his victory releases justice. And the fame of his name will birth hope among the people. Jesus frees a demonized man. Then a man was brought before Jesus who had a demon spirit that made him both blind and unable to speak. Jesus healed him instantly, and he could see and talk again. The crowds went wild with amazement as they witnessed this miracle, and they kept saying to one another, Could this man be the Messiah? But when the Pharisees overheard what the people were saying about the miracle, they said, He casts out demons by the power of Satan, the prince of demons. Now, Jesus supernaturally perceived their thoughts and motives, so he confronted them by telling them this parable. Any kingdom that fights against itself will end up in ruins, and any family or community splintered by strife will fall apart. So if Satan casts out Satan, he is making war on himself. How then could his kingdom survive? So if Satan empowers me to cast out demons, who empowers your exorcists to cast them out? Go, ask them, for what they do proves you're wrong in your accusations. On the other hand, if I drive out demons by the power of the Spirit of God, then the end of Satan's kingdom has come. Who would dare enter the house of a mighty man and steal his property? First, he must be overpowered and tied up by one who is stronger than he. Then his entire house can be plundered and every possession stolen. So join with me, for if you're not on my side, you are against me. And if you refuse to help me gather the spoils, you are making things worse. This is why I warn you, for God will forgive people for every sin and blasphemy they have committed except one. There is no forgiveness for the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. If anyone speaks evil of me, the Son of Man, he can be forgiven. But if anyone contemptuously speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will never be forgiven, now or ever. Only good trees bear good fruit. You must determine if a tree is good or rotten. You can, you can recognize good trees by their delicious fruit. But if you find rotten fruit, you can be certain that the tree is rotten. The fruit defines the tree. But you who are known as the Pharisees are rotten to the core. You've been poisoned by the nature of a venomous snake. How can your words be good and trustworthy if you are rotten within? For what has been stored up in your hearts will be heard in the overflow of your words. When virtue is stored within, the hearts of good and upright people will produce good fruit. But when evil is hidden within, those who are evil will produce evil fruit. You can be sure of this. When the day of judgment comes, everyone will be held accountable for every careless word he has spoken. Your very words will be used as evidence against you, and your words will declare you either innocent or guilty. The Sign of Jonah Then, a few Jewish scholars and Pharisees spoke up and said, Teacher, why don't you perform a miraculous sign for us? Jesus replied, Only evil people 
who are unfaithful to God would demand a sign. There will be no sign given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just like Jonah was in the belly of the huge sea creature for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The people of Nineveh will also rise up on the day of judgment to accuse and condemn this generation. For they all repented when they heard the preaching of Jonah. Yet you have refused to repent. And there is one greater than Jonah who is preaching to you today. Even the queen of Sheba will rise up on the day of judgment to accuse and condemn this generation for its unbelief. She journeyed from a far and distant land just to hear the wisdom of King Solomon. Yet now there is one greater than Solomon speaking to you, and you still refuse to listen. Demons When a demon is cast out of a person, it roams around a dry region looking for a place to rest, but never finds it. Then it says, I'll return to the house I moved out of. And so it goes back, only to find that the house is vacant, warm, and ready for it to move back in. So it goes looking for seven other demons, more evil than itself, and they all enter together to live there. Then the person's condition becomes much worse than it was in the beginning. This describes what will also happen to the people of this evil generation. Jesus' true family. While Jesus was still speaking to the crowds, his mother and brothers came and stood outside, asking for him to come out and speak with them. Then someone said, Look, your mother and brothers are standing outside, wanting to have a word with you. But Jesus just looked at him and said, Let me introduce you to my true mother and brothers. Then, gesturing to the disciples gathered around him, he said, Look closely. For this is my true family. When you obey my heavenly Father, that makes you a part of my true family. Matthew chapter 13 The Parables of Jesus Later that day, Jesus left the house and sat by the lake shore to teach the people. Soon, there were so many people surrounding him that he had to teach sitting in a boat while the large crowd stood on the shore. He taught them many things by using stories, parables that would illustrate spiritual truths, saying, Consider this. There was a farmer who went out to sow seeds. As he cast his seeds, some fell among the beaten path, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell into gravel that had no topsoil. The seeds quickly shot up, but when the days grew hot, the sprouts were scorched and withered because they had insufficient roots. Other seeds fell among thorns and weeds, so when the seeds sprouted, so did the weeds, crowding out the good plants. But other seeds fell on good, rich soil that kept producing a good harvest. Some yielded thirty, some sixty, and some even one hundred times as much as he planted. If you're able to understand this, then you need to respond. Then his disciples approached Jesus and asked, Why do you always speak to people in these hard-to-understand parables? He explained, You've been given the intimate experience of insight into the hidden truths and mysteries of the realm of heaven's kingdom, but they have not. For everyone who listens with an open heart will receive progressively more revelation until he has more than enough. But those who don't listen with an open, teachable heart, even the understanding that they think they have will be taken from them. That's why I teach the people using parables, because they think they're looking for truth, yet because their hearts are unteachable, they never discover it. Although they will listen to me, they never fully perceive the message I speak. 
the prophecy of Isaiah describes them perfectly. Although they listen carefully to everything I speak, they don't understand a thing I say. They look and pretend to see, but their eyes of their hearts are closed. Their minds are dull and slow to perceive. Their ears are plugged and are hard of hearing, and they have deliberately shut their eyes to the truth. Otherwise, they would open their eyes to see and open their ears to hear and open their minds to understand. Then they would turn to me and let me instantly heal them. But your eyes are privileged, for they see. Delighted are your ears, for they are open to hear all these things. Many prophets and godly people in times past yearn to see these days of miracles that you've been favored to see. They would have given everything to hear the revelation you've been favored to hear. Yet they didn't get to see as much as a glimpse or even hear even a whisper. Now you are ready to listen to the revelation of the parable of the sower and his seeds. The seed that fell on the beaten path represents the heart of the one who hears the message of the kingdom realm but doesn't understand it. The adversary then comes and snatches away what was sown into his heart. The seed sown on gravel represents the person who gladly hears the kingdom message, but his experience remains shallow. Shortly after he hears it, troubles and persecutions come because of the kingdom message he received. Then he quickly falls away, for the truth didn't seek deeply into his heart. The seed sown among weeds represents the person who receives the message, but all of life's busy distractions, his divided heart, and his ambition for wealth result in suffocating the kingdom message and prevent him from bearing spiritual fruit. As for the seed that fell upon good, rich soil, it represents the hearts of people who hear and fully embrace the message of heaven's kingdom realm. Their lives will bear good fruit. Some yield a harvest of 30, 60, even 100 times as much as was sown. The Parable of the Weeds Then Jesus taught them another parable. Heaven's kingdom realm can be compared to a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But at night, when everyone was asleep, an enemy came and planted poisonous weeds among the wheat and ran away. When the wheat sprouted and bore grain, the weeds also appeared. So the farmer hired hands came to him and said, Sir, wasn't that good seed that you sowed in the field? Where did all these weeds come from? He answered, This has to be the work of an enemy. They replied, Do you want us to go and gather up all the weeds? No, he said. If you pull out the weeds, you might uproot the wheat at the same time. You must allow them both to grow together until the time of the harvest. At that time, I'll tell my harvesters to make sure they gather the weeds first and tie them all in bundles to be burned. Then they will harvest the wheat and pull it into my barn. The Parable of the Tiny Mustard Seed Then Jesus taught them another parable. Heaven's kingdom realm can be compared to the tiny mustard seed that a man takes and plants in his field. Although the smallest of all the seeds, it eventually grows into the greatest of garden plants, becoming a tree for birds to come and build their nests in its branches. The Parable of the Yeast Then he taught them another parable. Heaven's kingdom realm can be compared to yeast that a woman takes and blends into three measures of flour and then waits until all the dough rises. Prophecy and Parables Whenever Jesus addresses the crowds, he always spoke in allegories. He never spoke without using parables. He did this in order to fulfill the prophecy. I will speak to you in allegories. I will reveal secrets that have been concealed since before the foundation of the world. 
Jesus explains the parables. Jesus left the crowds and went inside the house where he was staying. Then his disciples approached him and asked, Please explain the deeper meaning of the parable of the weeds growing in the field of wheat. He answered, The man who sowed his field with good seed represents me, the Son of Man, and the field is the world. The good seeds I sow are the children of the kingdom realm. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest points to the end of this age, and the harvesters are God's messengers. As the weeds are bundled up and thrown into the fire, so it will be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his messengers, and they will uproot everything out of his kingdom, and the lawless ones and everything that causes sin will be removed. And they will throw them into the fiery furnace, where they will experience great sorrow, pain, and anguish. Then the godly ones will shine like the brightness of the sun in their Father's kingdom realm. If you are able to understand this, then you'd better respond. Parables of Hidden Treasure and an Extraordinary Pearl Heaven's kingdom realm can be illustrated like this. A person discovered that there was hidden treasure in a field. Upon finding it, he hid it again. Because of uncovering such treasure, he was overjoyed and sold all that he had possessed to buy the entire field just so he could have the treasure. Heaven's kingdom realm is also like a jewel merchant in search of rare pearls. When he discovered one very precious and exquisite pearl, he immediately gave up all he had in exchange for it. The Parable of the Fishing Net Again, Heaven's kingdom realm is like a fisherman who casts his large net into the lake, catching an assortment of different kinds of fish. When the net was filled, the fishermen hauled it up on the shore, and they all sat down to sort out their catch. They collected the good fish in baskets and threw the bad away. And so it will be at the close of the age. The messengers will come and separate the evil from among the godly, and throw them into the fiery furnace, where they will experience great sorrow, pain, and anguish. Now do you understand all this? Yes they replied. He responded, Every scholar of the scriptures who is instructed in the ways of heaven's kingdom realm is like a wealthy homeowner with his house filled with treasures both new and old, and he knows how and when to bring them out to show others. Right after Jesus taught this series of parables, he left from there. Jesus rejected in his hometown. When Jesus arrived in his hometown of Nazareth, he began teaching the people in the synagogue. Everyone was dazed, overwhelmed with astonishment over the depth of revelation they were hearing. They said to one another, Where did this man get such great wisdom and miraculous powers? Isn't he just the woodworker's son? Isn't his mother named Mary and his four brothers Jacob, Joseph, Simon, and Judah? And don't his sisters all live here in Nazareth? How did he get all this revelation and power? And the people became offended and began to turn against him. Jesus said, There's only one place a prophet isn't honored, his own hometown. And their great unbelief kept him from doing any mighty miracles in Nazareth. Matthew chapter 14 John the Baptizer Killed At that time, Herod, the Roman ruler over Galilee, heard reports about Jesus. He told his officials, This man has to be John the Baptizer who has come back from the dead. That's why he has this power to work miracles. 
for Herod had earlier arrested John for confronting him over taking the wife of his brother Philip. He had John thrown in prison and placed in chains, because John had repeatedly said to him, It's not legal or proper for you to be married to Herodias, your sister-in-law. So Herod wanted John dead. But he was afraid of the crowds who flocked to John, because they considered him to be a prophet. During Herod's birthday celebration, the daughter of Herodias danced before Herod and all his distinguished guests, which greatly pleased the king. So he said to her in front of them all, I give you my oath. Ask me anything you wish, and it will be yours. Because she had been instructed by her mother, she said, I want the head of John the Baptizer here on a platter. This grieved the king, but because of his oath in front of all of his guests, he had John beheaded in prison. They brought in his head and displayed it to her on a platter, and she then had it shown to her mother. John's disciples went into the prison and carried his body away and buried it. Then they left to find Jesus and tell him what had happened. Jesus feeds the multitude. On hearing this, Jesus slipped away privately by boat to be alone. But when the crowds discovered he had sailed away, they emerged from all the nearby towns and followed him on foot. So when Jesus landed, he had a huge crowd waiting for him. Seeing so many people, his heart was deeply moved with compassion toward them, so he healed all the sick who were in the crowd. Later that afternoon, the disciples came to Jesus and said, It's going to be dark soon, and the people are hungry, but there's nothing to eat here in this desolate place. You should send the crowds away to the nearby villages to buy themselves some food. They don't need to leave, Jesus responded. You can give them something to eat. They answered, But all we have is five barley loaves and two fish. Let me have them, Jesus replied. Then he had everyone sit down on the grass as he took the five loaves and two fish. He looked up into heaven, gave thanks to God, and broke the bread into pieces. Then he gave it to his disciples, who in turn gave it to the crowds. And everyone ate until they were satisfied, for the food was multiplied in front of their eyes. They picked up the leftovers and filled up twelve baskets full. There were about five thousand men who were fed in addition to many women and children. Jesus walks on water. As soon as the people were fed, Jesus told his disciples to get into their boat and to go to the other side of the lake while he stayed behind to dismiss the people. After the crowds dispersed, Jesus went up into the hills to pray, and as night fell, he was there praying alone with God. But the disciples, who were now in the middle of the lake, ran into trouble, for their boat was tossed about by the high winds and heavy seas. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them, walking on the waves. When the disciples saw him walking on top of the water, they were terrified and screamed, A ghost! Then Jesus said, Be brave and don't be afraid. I am here. Peter shouted out, Lord, if it's really you, then have me join you on the water. Come and join me, Jesus replied. So Peter stepped out onto the water and began to walk toward Jesus. But when he realized how high the waves were, he became frightened and started to sink. Save me, Lord, he cried out. Jesus immediately stretched out his hand and lifted him up and said, What little faith you have! Why would you let doubt win? And the very moment they both stepped into the boat, the raging wind ceased. 
Then all the disciples crouched down before him and worshipped Jesus. They said in adoration, You are truly the Son of God. After they crossed over and landed at Gennesaret, the people living there quickly recognized who he was. They were quick to spread the news throughout the surrounding region that Jesus had come to them. So they brought him all their sick, begging him to let them touch the fringe of his robe. And everyone who touched it was instantly healed. Matthew chapter 15 Jesus breaks religious traditions. Then the Pharisees and religious scholars came from Jerusalem and approached Jesus with this question. Why do your disciples ignore the traditions of our elders? For example, they don't ceremonially wash their hands before they eat bread. Jesus answered, And why do you ignore the commandment of God because of your traditions? For didn't God say, Honor your father and mother, and whoever abuses or insults his father or mother must be put to death? But you teach that it's permissible to say to your parents when they are in financial need, whatever gift you would have received from me, I can keep for myself since I dedicated it as an offering to God. This doesn't honor your father or mother and you have elevated your tradition above the words of God. Frauds and hypocrites. Isaiah described you perfectly when he said, these people honor me only with their words, for their hearts are so very distant from me. They pretend to worship me, but their worship is nothing more than the empty traditions of men. Then Jesus turned to the crowd and said, Come, listen, and open your heart to understand. What truly contaminates a person is not what he puts into his mouth, but what comes out of his mouth. That's what makes people defiled. Then his disciples approached him and said, Don't you know that what you just said offended the Pharisees? Jesus replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father didn't plant is destined to be uprooted. Stay away from them, for they're nothing more than blind guides. Do you know what happens when a blind man pretends to guide another blind man? They both stumble into a ditch. Peter spoke up and said, Will you explain to us what you mean by your parable? Jesus said, Even after all that I've taught you, you still remain clueless? Is it hard to understand that whatever you eat enters the stomach only to pass out into the sewer? But what comes out of your mouth reveals the core of your heart. Words can pollute, not food. You will find living within an impure heart evil ideas, murderous thoughts, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, lies, and slander. That's what pollutes a person. Eating with unwashed hands doesn't defile anyone. A Lebanese Woman's Faith then, Jesus left and went north into the non-Jewish region of Lebanon. He encountered there a Canaanite woman who screamed out to him, Lord, son of David, show mercy to me. My daughter is horribly afflicted by a demon that torments her. But Jesus never answered her. So his disciples said to him, why do you ignore this woman who is crying out to us? Jesus said, I've only been sent to the lost sheep of Israel. But she came and bowed down before him and said, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, It's not right for a man to take bread from his children and throw it out to the dogs. You're right, Lord, she replied. But even puppies get to eat the crumbs that fall from the prince's table. Then Jesus answered her, 
Dear woman, your faith is strong. What you desire will be done for you. And at that very moment, her daughter was instantly set free from demonic torment. Jesus heals many others. After leaving Lebanon, Jesus went to Lake Galilee and climbed a hill nearby and sat down. Then, huge crowds of people streamed up the hill, bringing with them the lame, blind, deformed, mute, and many others in need of healing. They laid them at Jesus' feet, and he healed them all. And the crowds marveled with rapture and amazement, astounded over the things they were witnessing with their own eyes. The lame were walking, the mute were speaking, the crippled were made well, and the blind could see. For three days, everyone celebrated the miracles as they exalted and praised the God of Israel. Jesus feeds thousands. Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I care deeply about all these people, for they've already been with me for three days without food. I don't want to send them away fasting, or else they may be overcome by weakness on their journey home. So the disciples said to him, Where in the world are we going to find enough food in this desolate place to feed this crowd? How many barley loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. So he gave the order, Have the people sit down on the grass. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks to God. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, who then distributed the food to the crowds. When everyone was full and satisfied, they gathered up the leftovers, and from what was once seven loaves and a few small fish, they filled seven baskets. There were four thousand men who ate the food Jesus multiplied, and even more, including the women and children. After dismissing the crowd, Jesus got into the boat and crossed over to the region of Magdala. Matthew chapter 16 The Demand for a Sign from Heaven One day, some of the Pharisees and those of the Jewish sect known as the Sadducees approached Jesus, insisting that he prove to them that he was the Messiah. Show us a supernatural sign from heaven, they demanded. Jesus answered, You can read the signs of the weather, for you say, Red sky at night, sailors delight, and red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. You're so apt at forecasting the weather by looking at the sky, but you're absolutely clueless in reading the obvious signs of the times. A wicked and wayward generation asks for signs, but the only sign I provide for you will be the sign of Jonah the prophet. Then he turned away and left them. The Hypocrisy of the Pharisees and Sadducees Later, as Jesus and his disciples crossed over to the other side of Lake Galilee, the disciples realized that they had forgotten to bring any loaves of bread. Jesus spoke up and said, Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Thinking Jesus was scolding them over not bringing bread, they whispered among themselves. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, You have such little faith. Why are you arguing with one another about having no bread? Are you so slow to understand? Have you forgotten the miracle of feeding the 5,000 families and how each of you ended up with a basket full of fragments? And how seven loaves of bread fed 4,000 families with baskets left over? Don't you understand? I'm not talking about bread, but I'm warning you to avoid the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then finally, they realized he wasn't talking about yeast found in bread, but the error of the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
Peter's Revelation of Christ When Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples this question. What are the people saying about me, the Son of Man? Who do they believe I am? They answered, Some are convinced you are John the Baptizer. Others say you are Elijah reincarnated, or Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. But you, who do you say that I am? Jesus asked. Simon Peter spoke up and said, You are the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God. Jesus replied, You are favored and privileged, Simon, son of Jonah. For you didn't discover this on your own, but my Father in Heaven has supernaturally revealed it to you. I give you the name Peter, a stone, and this truth of who I am will be the bedrock foundation on which I will build my church. My legislative assembly and the power of death will not be able to overpower it. I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth what is forbidden in heaven and to release on earth that which is released in heaven. He then gave his disciples strict orders not to tell anyone that he was God's anointed one. Jesus prophesies his death and resurrection. From then on, Jesus began to clearly reveal to his disciples that he was destined to go to Jerusalem and suffer injustice from the elders, leading priests, and religious scholars. He also explained that he would be killed and three days later be raised to life again. Peter took him aside to correct him privately. He reprimanded Jesus over and over, saying to him, God forbid, Master! Spare yourself! You must never let this happen to you! Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get out of my way, you Satan! You are an offense to me, because your thoughts are only filled with man's viewpoints and not with the ways of God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If you truly want to follow me, you should at once completely reject and disown your own life, and you must be willing to share my cross and experience it as your own, as you continually surrender to my ways. For if you choose self-sacrifice and lose your lives for my glory, you will continually discover true life. But if you choose to keep your lives for yourselves, you will forfeit what you try to keep. For even if you were to gain all the wealth and power of this world with everything it could offer you at the cost of your own life, what good would that be? And what could be more valuable to you than your own soul? It has been decreed that I, the Son of Man, will one day return with my messengers and in the splendor and majesty of my Father. And then I will reward each person according to what they have done. But I promise you, there are some standing here now who won't experience death until they have witnessed the coming of the Son of Man in the presence and the power of the kingdom realm of God. Matthew chapter 17 Jesus' Glorious Transfiguration Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers Jacob and John and hiked up a high mountain to be alone. Then Jesus' appearance was dramatically altered. A radiant light, as bright as the sun, poured from his face, and his clothing became luminescent, dazzling like lightning. He was transfigured before their very eyes. Then suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared, and they spoke with Jesus. Peter blurted out, 
Lord, it's so wonderful that we're all here together. If you want, I'll construct three shrines. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But while Peter spoke, a radiant cloud composed of light spread over them, enveloping them all. And God's voice suddenly spoke from the cloud, saying, This is my dearly loved son, the constant focus of my delight. Listen to him. The three disciples were dazed and terrified by this phenomena, and they fell face down to the ground. But Jesus walked over and touched them, saying, Get up and stop being afraid. When they finally opened their eyes and looked around, they saw no one else but Jesus. As they all hiked down the mountain together, Jesus ordered them, Don't tell anyone of the divine appearance you just witnessed. Wait until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. His disciples asked him, Why do all the religious scholars insist that Elijah must first appear before the Anointed One comes? He answered them, They're right. Elijah must come first and restore all things. But Elijah has already appeared. And yet they didn't recognize him, so they did to him whatever they pleased. And the Son of Man is destined to suffer the same abuse as what they did to him. Then the disciples realized that Jesus was referring to John the Baptizer all along. Unbelief hinders healing. They came to where a large crowd had gathered to wait for Jesus. A man came and knelt before him and said, Lord, please, please show your tender mercy toward my son. He has a demon who afflicts him. He has epilepsy and he suffers horribly from seizures. He often falls into the cooking fire or into the river. I brought him to your followers, but they weren't able to heal him. Jesus replied, Where is your faith? Can't you see how wayward and wrong this generation is? How much longer do I stay with you and put up with your doubts? Bring your son to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was instantly healed. Later, the disciples came to him privately and asked, Why couldn't we cast out the demon? He told them, It was because of your lack of faith. I promise you, if you have faith inside of you, no bigger than the size of a small mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move away from here and go over there, and you will see it move. There is nothing you can't do. But this kind of demon is cast out only through prayer and fasting. Jesus prophesies again of his death and resurrection. When they all gathered together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed and turned over to his enemies. They will kill him. And in three days, he will be resurrected. When the disciples heard these words, they were devastated. The miracle of a coin in a fish's mouth after they arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax approached Peter and asked, Does your teacher pay the tax for the upkeep of the temple like the rest of us? Of course he does, Peter answered. When Peter walked into the house, and before he had a chance to speak, Jesus spoke up and said, Peter, I have a question for you. Who pays tolls or taxes to a king? Is tax collected from the king's own children or from his subjects? From his subjects, Peter answered. Jesus replied, That's right. The children get off free without paying taxes. 
but so that we don't offend them. Go to the lake and throw out your hook, and the first fish that rises up will have a coin in its mouth. It will be the exact amount you need to pay the temple tax for both of us. Matthew chapter 18 Who is the greatest in the kingdom realm? At that time, the disciples came to ask Jesus, Who is considered to be the greatest in heaven's kingdom realm? Jesus called a little one to his side and said to them, Learn this well. Unless you dramatically change your way of thinking and become teachable and learn about heaven's kingdom realm with the wide-eyed wonder of a child, you will never be able to enter in. Whoever continually humbles himself to become like this gentle child is the greatest one in heaven's kingdom realm. And if you tenderly care for this little one on my behalf, you are tenderly caring for me. But if anyone abuses one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for him to have a heavy boulder tied around his neck and be hurled into the deepest sea than to face the punishment he deserves. Misery will come to the one who lures people away into sin. Troubles and obstacles to your faith are inevitable, but great devastation will come to the one guilty of causing others to leave the path of righteousness. If your hand clings to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If your foot continually steps onto sin's path, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to enter into heaven crippled and maimed than to have both hands and feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye is always focusing on sin, pluck it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to enter into heaven with one eye than to be thrown into hellfire with two. Be careful that you not corrupt one of these little ones. For I can assure you that in heaven, each of their angelic guardians have instant access to my heavenly Father. A Parable of the Lost Lamb The Son of Man has come to give life to anyone who is lost. Think of it this way. If a man owns a hundred sheep and one lamb wanders away and is lost, won't he leave the ninety-nine grazing on the hillside and go out and thoroughly search for the one lost lamb? And if he finds his lost lamb, he rejoices over it, more than over the ninety-nine who are safe. Now you should understand that it is never the desire of your heavenly Father that a single one of these humble believers should be lost. Restoring Broken Relationships if your fellow believer sins against you, you must go to that one privately and attempt to resolve the matter. If he responds, your relationship is restored. But if his heart is close to you, then go to him again, taking one or two others with you. You'll be fulfilling what the scripture teaches when it says, Every word may be verified by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And if he refuses to listen, then share the issue with the entire church in hopes of restoration. If he still refuses to respond, disregarding the fellowship of his church family, you must disregard him as though he were an outsider on the same level as an unrepentant sinner. Receive this truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be considered to be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you release on earth will be considered to be released in heaven. Again, I give you an eternal truth. If two of you agree to ask God for something in a symphony of prayer, my heavenly Father will do it for you. For wherever two or three come together in honor of my name, I am right there with him. Unlimited Forgiveness Later, Peter approached Jesus and said, How many times do I have to forgive my fellow believer who keeps offending me? 
Seven times? Jesus answered, Not seven times, Peter, but seventy times seven times. The lessons of forgiveness in heaven's kingdom realm can be illustrated like this. There once was a king who had servants who had borrowed money from the royal treasury. He decided to settle accounts with each of them. As he began the process, it came to his attention that one of his servants owed him one billion dollars. So he summoned the servant before him and said to him, Pay me what you owe me. When his servant was unable to repay his debt, the king ordered that he be sold as a slave, along with his wife and children, and every possession they owned as payment toward his debt. The servant threw himself face down at his master's feet and begged for mercy. Please be patient with me. Just give me more time and I will repay you all that I owe. Upon hearing his pleas, the king had compassion on his servant and released him and forgave his entire debt. No sooner had the servant left when he met one of his fellow servants who owed him twenty thousand dollars. He seized him by the throat and began to choke him, saying, You better pay me right now everything you owe me. His fellow servant threw himself face down at his feet and begged, Please! Be patient with me. If you'll just give me time, I will repay you all that is owed. But the one who had his debt forgiven stubbornly refused to forgive what was owed him. He had his fellow servant thrown into prison and demanded he remain there until he repaid the full debt. When his associates saw what was going on, they were outraged and went to the king and told him the whole story. The king said to him, You scoundrel! Is this the way you respond to my mercy? Because you begged me, I forgave you the massive debt that you owed me. Why didn't you show the same mercy to your fellow servant that I showed to you? In a fury of anger, the king turned him over to the prison guards to be tortured until all his debt was repaid. In the same way, my heavenly Father will deal with any of you if you do not release forgiveness from your heart toward your fellow believer. Matthew chapter 19 Questions about Divorce After Jesus finished teaching them, he left Galilee and made his way toward the district of Judea, east of the Jordan River. Massive crowds followed him, and he healed all who were sick. The Pharisees were intent on putting Jesus to the test with difficult questions, so they approached him and asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Haven't you read the scriptures about creation? Jesus replied. The Creator made us male and female from the very beginning. And, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and live with his wife and the two will become one flesh. From then on, they are no longer two, but united as one. So what God unites, let no one divide. They responded, So then why did Moses command us to give a certificate of divorce, and it would be lawful? Jesus said, Moses permitted you to divorce because your hearts are so hard and stubborn. But originally there was no such thing. But I say to you, whoever leaves his wife for any reason other than immorality, then takes another wife, is living in adultery. And whoever takes a divorced woman in marriage is also living in adultery. His disciples spoke up and said, If this is the standard, then it seems better to never get married. Not everyone is meant to remain single. Only those whom God gives grace to be unmarried. For some are born to celibacy. Others have been made eunuchs by others. And there are some who have chosen to live in celibacy for the sacred purpose of heaven's kingdom realm. Let those who can accept this truth for themselves. 
Jesus and Little Children Then they brought little children to Jesus, so that he would lay his hands on them, bless them, and pray for them. But the disciples scolded those who brought the children, saying, Don't bother him with this now. Jesus overheard them and said, I want little children to come to me, so never interfere with them when they want to come, for heaven's kingdom realm is composed of beloved ones like these. Listen to this truth. No one will enter the kingdom realm of heaven unless he becomes like one of these. Then he laid his hands on each of them and went on his way. A rich young man questions Jesus. Then a teenager approached Jesus and bowed before him, saying, Wonderful teacher, is there a good work I have to do to obtain eternal life? Jesus answered, Why would you call me wonderful? God alone is wonderful. And why would you ask what good work you need to do? Keep the commandments, and you'll enter into the life of God. Which ones? he asked. Jesus said, Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie. Honor your father and mother, and love those around you as you love yourself. But I've always obeyed every one of them without fail, the young man replied. What else do I lack? Jesus said to him, If you really want to be perfect, go immediately and sell everything you own. Give all your money to the poor, and your treasure will be transferred into heaven. Then come back and follow me for the rest of your life. When the young man heard these words, he walked away angry, for he was extremely wealthy. Then Jesus turned to his disciples and said, Listen, do you understand how difficult it is for the rich to enter into heaven's kingdom realm? In fact, it's easier to stuff a heavy rope through the eye of a needle than it is for the wealthy to enter into God's kingdom realm. Stunned and bewildered, his disciples asked, Then who in the world can possibly be saved? Looking straight into their eyes, Jesus replied, Humanly speaking, no one, because no one can save himself. But what seems impossible to you is never impossible to God. Then Peter blurted out, here we are. We've given up everything to follow you. What reward will there be for us? Jesus responded, Listen to the truth. In the age of the restoration of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will have twelve thrones of your own, and you will govern the twelve tribes of Israel. For anyone who has left behind their home and property, leaving family, brothers or sisters, mothers or fathers, or children, for my sake, they will be repaid a hundred times over and will inherit eternal life. But many who push themselves to be first will find themselves last, and those who are willing to be last will find themselves to be first. Matthew chapter 20 A parable of workers in the vineyard This will help you understand the way heaven's kingdom operates. There once was a wealthy landowner who went out at daybreak to hire all the laborers he could find to work in his vineyard. After agreeing to pay them the standard day's wage, he put them to work. Then, at nine o'clock, as he was passing through the town square, he found others standing around without work. He told them, Come and work for me in my vineyard, and I'll pay you a fair wage. So off they went to join the others. He did the same thing at noon, and again at three o'clock, making the same arrangements as he did with the others. Hoping to finish his harvest that day, he went to the town square again at five o'clock, and found more who were idle, 
So he said to them, Why have you been here all day without work? Because no one hired us, they answered. So he said to them, Then go and join my crew and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard went to his foreman and said, Call in all the laborers, line them up, and pay them the same wages, starting with the most recent ones I hired and finishing with the ones who worked all day. When those hired late in the day came to be paid, they were given a full day's wage. And when those who had been hired first came to be paid, they were convinced that they would receive more. But everyone was paid the standard wage. When they realized what had happened, they were offended and complained to the landowner, saying, You're treating us unfairly. They've only worked for one hour while we've slaved and sweated all day under the scorching sun. You've made them equal to us. The landowner replied, Friends, I'm not being unfair. I'm doing exactly what I said. Didn't you agree to work for the standard wage? If I want to give those who only worked for an hour equal pay, what does that matter to you? Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Why should my generosity make you jealous of them? Now you can understand what I meant when I said that the first will end up last and the last will end up being first. Everyone is invited, but few are chosen. Jesus again prophesies his death. Jesus was about to go to Jerusalem, so he took his twelve disciples aside privately and said to them, Listen to me. We're on our way to Jerusalem, and I need to remind you that the Son of Man will be handed over to the religious leaders and scholars, and they will sentence him to be executed. And they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, tortured, and crucified. Yet three days later, he will be raised to life again. The Ambition of Jacob and John the wife of Zebedee approached Jesus with her sons Jacob and John. She knelt before him and asked him for a favor. He said to her, What is it that you want? She answered, Make a decree that these, my sons, will rule with you in your kingdom, one sitting on your right hand, one on your left. Jesus replied, you don't know what you are asking. Then, looking into the eyes of Jacob and John, Jesus said, Are you prepared to drink from the cup of suffering that I am about to drink? Are you able to endure the baptism into death that I am about to endure? They answered him, Yes, we are able. You will indeed drink the cup of my suffering and be immersed into my death, Jesus told them. But to be the ones who sit at the place of highest honor is not mine to decide. My Father is the one who chooses them and prepares them. The other ten disciples were listening to all of this, and a jealous anger arose among them against the two brothers. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, called them to his side and said, Kings and those with great authority in this world rule oppressively over their subjects, like tyrants. But this is not your calling. You will lead by a completely different model. The greatest one among you will live as the one who is called to serve others, because the greatest honor and authority is reserved for the one with the heart of a servant. For even the Son of Man did not come expecting to be served by everyone, but to serve everyone, and to give his life in exchange for the salvation of many. Two blind men healed. As Jesus approached Jericho, an immense crowd gathered and followed him, and there were two blind men sitting on the roadside. When they heard that it was Jesus passing by, they shouted, 
Son of David, show us mercy, Lord. Those in the crowd scolded them and told them to be quiet. But the blind men screamed out even louder, Jesus, Son of David, show us mercy, Lord. So Jesus stopped and had them brought to him. He asked them, What do you want me to do for you? They said, Lord, we want to see. Heal us. Jesus was deeply moved with compassion toward them. So he touched their eyes and instantly they could see. Jesus said to them, Your faith has healed you. And all the people praised God because of this miracle. And the two men became his followers from that day onward. Matthew chapter 21 Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem Now, as they were approaching Jerusalem, they arrived at the place of the stables near the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead, saying, As soon as you enter the village, you will find a donkey tethered along with her young colt. Untie them both and bring them to me. And if anyone stops you and asks, what are you doing? Just tell them, the Lord of all needs them, and he will let you take them. All of this happened to fulfill the prophecy. Tell Zion's daughter, look, your king arrives. He's coming to you full of gentleness, sitting on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So the two disciples went on ahead and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and her colt to him and placed their cloaks and prayer shawls on the colt as Jesus rode on it. Then an exceptionally large crowd gathered and carpeted the road before him with their cloaks and prayer shawls. Others cut down branches from trees and spread them in his path. Jesus rode in the center of the procession, crowds going before him and crowds coming behind him, and they all shouted, Bring the victory, Lord, son of David. He comes with the blessings of being sent from the Lord Yahweh. We celebrate with praises to God in the highest. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, the people went wild with excitement. The entire city was thrown into an uproar. Some asked, Who is this man? And the crowds shouted back, This is Jesus! He's the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Jesus in the Temple Upon entering Jerusalem, Jesus went directly into the temple area and drove away all the merchants who were buying and selling their goods. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the stands of those selling doves. And he said to them, My dwelling place will be known as a house of prayer. But you have made it into a hangout for thieves. Then the blind and the crippled came into the temple courts, and Jesus healed them all. And the children circled around him, shouting out, Blessings and praises to the Son of David. But when the chief priests and religious scholars heard the children shouting and saw all the wonderful miracles of healing, they were furious. They said to Jesus, Don't you hear what these children are saying? This is not right. Jesus answered, Yes, I hear them. But have you never heard the words? You have fashioned the lips of children and little ones to compose your praises? Jesus then left at once for the nearby village of Bethany, where he spent the night. While walking back into the city the next morning, he got hungry. He noticed a lone fig tree by the side of the path and walked over to see if there was any fruit on it, but there was none. He found only leaves. So he spoke to the fig tree and said, You will be barren and will never bear fruit again. Instantly, the fig tree shriveled up right in front of their eyes. Astonished, his disciples asked, How did you make this fig tree instantly wither and die? 
Jesus said, listen to the truth. If you have no doubt of God's power and speak out of faith's fullness, you can be the ones who speak to a tree and it will wither away. Even more than that, you could say to this mountain, be lifted up and be thrown into the sea and it will be done. Everything you pray for with the fullness of faith you will receive. The Authority of Jesus After this, Jesus went into the temple courts and taught the people. The leading priests and Jewish elders approached him and interrupted him and asked, By what power do you do these things, and who granted you the authority to teach here? Jesus answered them, I too have a question to ask you. If you can answer this question, then I will tell you by what power I do these things. From where did John's authority to baptize come from? From heaven or from people? They stepped away and debated among themselves, saying, How shall we answer this? If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Then why didn't you respond to John and believe what he said? But if we deny that God gave him his authority, we'll be mobbed by the people, for they're convinced that John was God's prophet. So they finally answered, We don't know. Then neither will I tell you from where my power comes to do these things, he replied. The Parable of Two Sons Jesus said to his critics, Tell me what you think about this parable. There once was a man with two sons. The father came to the first and said, Son, I want you to go and work in the vineyard today. The son replied, I'd rather not. But afterward, he deeply regretted what he said to his father, changed his mind, and decided to go to the vineyard. The father approached the second son and said the same thing to him. The son replied, Father, I will go and do as you have said. But he never did. He didn't go to the vineyard. Tell me now, which of these two sons did the will of his father? They answered him, The first one. Jesus said, You're right. For many sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes are going into God's kingdom realm ahead of you. John came to show you the path of goodness and righteousness, yet the despised and outcasts believed in him, but you did not. When you saw them turn, you neither repented of your ways nor believed his words. The Parable of the Rejected Son Pay close attention to this parable, Jesus said. There once was an honorable man who planted a vineyard. He built a fence around it, dug out a pit for pressing the grapes, and erected a watchtower. Afterward, he leased the land to tenant farmers and then went a distance away. At harvest time, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect the portion that was due him as the lord of the vineyard. But the tenants seized his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. So the landowner sent other servants, even more than at first, but they were mistreated the same way. Finally, he sent his own son to them, and he said to himself, Perhaps with my own son standing before them, they will be ashamed of what they've done. But when the tenants saw the son, they said, This is the heir. Let's kill him, and then we can have his inheritance. So they violently seized him, took him outside the vineyard, and murdered him. You tell me, when the Lord of the vineyard comes, what do you think he will do to those tenants? They answered, He will bring a horrible death to those who did this evil, and he will completely destroy them. Then he'll lease his vineyard to different tenants who will be faithful to give him the portion he deserves. Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read the scripture that says, The very stone 
the builder rejected as flawed has now become the most important capstone of the ark. This was the Lord's plan. Isn't it a miracle for our eyes to behold? This is why I say to you that the kingdom realm of God will be taken from you and given to a people who will bear its fruit. The one who comes against this stone will be broken, but the one on whom it falls will be pulverized. When the leading priests and the Pharisees realized that the parable was referring to them, they were outraged and wanted to arrest him at once. But they were afraid of the reaction of the crowds because the people considered him to be a prophet. Matthew chapter 22 Parable of the Wedding Feast As was his custom, Jesus continued to teach the people by using allegories. He illustrated the reality of heaven's kingdom realm by saying, There once was a king who arranged an extravagant wedding feast for his son. On the day the festivities were set to begin, he sent his servants to summon all the invited guests, but they chose not to come. So the king sent even more servants to inform the invited guests, saying, Come, for the sumptuous feast is now ready. The oxen and the fatted cattle have been killed and everything is prepared, so come. Come to the wedding feast for my son and his bride. But the invited guests were not impressed. One was preoccupied with his business, another went off to his farming enterprise, and the rest seized the king's messengers and shamefully mistreated them and even killed them. This infuriated the king, so he sent his soldiers to execute those murderers and had their cities burned to the ground. Then the king said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, yet those who had been invited to attend didn't deserve the honor. Now, I want you to go into the streets and alleyways and invite anyone and everyone you find to come and enjoy the wedding feast in honor of my son. So the servants went out into the city streets and invited everyone to come to the wedding feast, good and bad alike, until the banquet hall was crammed with people. Now, when the king entered the banqueting hall, he looked with glee over all his guests. But then he noticed a guest who was not wearing the wedding robe provided for him. So he said, my friend, how is it that you're here and you're not wearing your wedding garment? But the man was speechless. Then the king turned to his servants and said, Tie him up and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be great sorrow and weeping and grinding of teeth. For everyone is invited to enter in, but few respond in excellence. The Pharisees tried to entrap Jesus. Then the Pharisees came together to make a plan to entrap Jesus with his own words. So they sent some of their disciples together with some of the staunch supporters of Herod. They said to Jesus, Teacher, we know that you're an honest man, full of integrity, and you teach us the truth of God's ways. We can clearly see that you're not one who speaks only to win the people's favor because you speak the truth without regard to the consequences. So tell us then, what do you think? Is it proper for us Jews to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus knew the malice that was hidden behind their cunning ploy and said, Why are you testing me, you impostors who think you have all the answers? Show me one of the Roman coins. So they brought him a silver coin used to pay the tax. Now, tell me, whose head is on this coin and whose inscription is stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Jesus said, Precisely, for the coin bears the image of the emperor Caesar. Well then, you should pay the emperor what is due to the emperor. 
but because you bear the image of God, give back to God all that belongs to Him. The impostors were baffled in the presence of all the people and were unable to trap Jesus with his words. So they left, stunned by Jesus' words. Marriage and the Resurrection Some of the Sadducees, a religious group that denied there was a re resurrection of the dead, came to ask Jesus this question. Teacher, the law of Moses teaches that if a man dies before he has children, his brother should marry the widow and raise up children for his brother's family line. Now, there was a family with seven brothers. The oldest got married, but soon died, leaving his widow for his brother. The second brother married and also died, and the third also. This was repeated down to the seventh brother, when finally the woman also died. So here's our dilemma. Which of the seven brothers will be the woman's husband when she's resurrected from the dead, since they all were once married to her? Jesus answered them, You are deluded, because your hearts are not filled with the revelation of the scriptures or the power of God. For after the resurrection, men and women will not marry, just like the angels of heaven don't marry. Haven't you read what God said? I am the living God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were dazed, stunned over such wisdom. The Greatest Commandment When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they called a meeting to discuss how to trap Jesus. Then one of them, a religious scholar, posed this question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus answered him, Love the Lord your God with every passion of your heart, with all the energy of your being, and with every thought that is within you. This is the great and supreme command, and the second is like it in importance. You must love your friend in the same way you love yourself. Contained within these commandments to love, you will find all the meaning of the law and the prophets. Jesus, Son of David, Lord of David. While all the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus took the opportunity to pose a question of his own. What do you think about the Anointed One? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, How is it that David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, could call his son the Lord? For didn't he say, the Lord Jehovah said to my Lord, Sit near me in the place of authority until I subdue all your enemies under your feet. So how could David call his own son the Lord Jehovah? No one could come up with an answer. And from that day on, no one of the Pharisees had the courage to question Jesus any longer. Matthew chapter 23 Superficial Spirituality versus Genuine Humility Then Jesus addressed both the crowds and his disciples and said, The religious scholars and the Pharisees sit on Moses' throne as the authorized interpreters of the law. So listen and follow what they teach, but don't do what they do, for they tell you one thing, and do another. They tie on your backs an oppressive burden of religious obligations and insist that you carry it, but will never lift a finger to help ease your load. Everything they do is done for show and to be noticed by others. They want to be seen as holy, so they wear oversized prayer boxes on their arms and foreheads with scriptures inside and wear extra long tassels on their outer garments. 
They crave the seats of highest honor at banquets and in their meeting places. And how they love to be admired by men with their titles of respect, aspiring to be recognized in public, and have others call them reverend. But you are to be different from that. You are not to be called master, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers and sisters. And you are not to be addressed as father, for you have one father who is in heaven. Nor are you to be addressed as teacher, for you have one teacher, the anointed one. The greatest among you will be the one who always serves others from the heart. Remember this, if you have a lofty opinion of yourself and seek to be honored, you will be humbled. But if you have a modest opinion of yourself and choose to humble yourself, you will be honored. Jesus pronounces seven woes. Great sorrow awaits you religious scholars and you Pharisees, such frauds and pretenders. You do all you can to keep people from experiencing the reality of heaven's kingdom realm. Not only do you refuse to enter in, you also forbid anyone else from entering in. Great sorrow awaits you religious scholars and you Pharisees, frauds and pretenders. For you eat up the widow's household with the ladle of your prayers. Because of this, you will receive a greater judgment. Great sorrow awaits you, religious scholars and you Pharisees, such frauds and pretenders. For you will travel over lake and land to find one disciple, only to make him twice the child of hell as yourselves. You blind guides, great sorrow awaits you. For you teach that there's nothing binding when you swear by God's temple. But if you swear by the gold of the temple, you are bound by your oath. You are deceived in your blindness. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? And you say that whoever takes an oath by swearing by the altar, it is nothing. But if you swear by the gift upon the altar, then you are obligated to keep your oath. What deception! For what is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Whoever swears by the altar, swears by the altar and everything offered on it. And whoever swears by the temple, swears by it and the one who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God and by God who sits upon it. Great sorrow awaits you, religious scholars and Pharisees, frauds and pretenders. For you are obsessed with peripheral issues like insisting on paying meticulous tithes on the smallest herbs that grow in your gardens. These matters are fine, yet you ignore the most important duty of all, to walk in the love of God, to display mercy to others, and to live with integrity. Readjust your values and place first things first. What blind guides, nitpickers. You will spoon out a gnat from your drink Yet at the same time, you've gulped down a camel without even realizing it. Great sorrow awaits you, religious scholars and Pharisees, frauds and impostors. You are like one who will only wipe clean the outside of a cup or bowl, leaving the inside filthy. You are foolish to ignore the greed and self-indulgence that live like germs within you. You are blind and deaf to your evil. Shouldn't the one who cleans the outside also be concerned with cleaning the inside? You need to have more than clean dishes. You need clean hearts. Great sorrow awaits you, religious scholars and Pharisees, frauds and impostors. You are nothing more than tombs painted with fresh coats of white paint, tombs that look shining and beautiful on the outside, but within are found decaying corpses full of nothing but corruption. Outwardly you masquerade as righteous people, but inside your hearts are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Great sorrow awaits you, religious scholars and Pharisees, frauds and hypocrites. You build memorials to the prophets your ancestors killed and decorate the monuments of the godly people your ancestors murdered. 
Then you boast, if we had lived back then, we would never have permitted them to kill the prophets. But your words and deeds testify that you are just like them and prove that you are indeed the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead and finish what your ancestors started. You are nothing but snakes in the grass, the offspring of poisonous vipers. How will you escape the judgment of hell if you refuse to turn in repentance? For this reason, I will send you more prophets and wise men and teachers of truth. Some you will crucify, and some you will beat mercilessly with whips in your meeting houses, abusing and persecuting them from city to city. As your penalty, you will be held responsible for the righteous blood spilled and the murders of every godly person throughout your history. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Jeoniah, whom you killed as he stood in the temple between the brazen altar and the holy place. I tell you the truth. The judgment for all these things will fall upon this generation. Jesus prophesies judgment coming to Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you are the city that murders your prophets. You are the city that stones the very messengers who were sent to deliver you. So many times I have longed to gather a wayward people as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were too stubborn to let me. And now it's, it's too late, since your city will be left in ruins. For you will not see me again until you are able to say, we welcome the one who comes to us in the name of the Lord. Matthew chapter 24 Jesus prophesies the destruction of the temple. As Jesus was leaving the temple courts, his disciples came to him and pointed out the beautiful aspects of the architecture of the temple structures. And Jesus turned to them and said, Take a good look at all these things, for I am telling you, there will not be one stone left upon another. It will all be leveled. Later, when they arrived at the Mount of Olives, his disciples came privately to where he was sitting and said, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what supernatural sign should we expect to signal your coming and the completion of this age? Jesus answered, At that time, deception will run rampant, so beware that you are not fooled. For many will appear on the scene claiming my authority or saying about themselves, I am God's anointed, and they will lead many astray. You will hear of wars nearby and revolutions on every side with more rumors of wars to come. Don't panic or give in to your fears, for the breaking apart of the world's system is destined to happen. But it won't yet be the end. It will still be unfolding. Nations will go to war against each other, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be terrible earthquakes, seismic events of epic proportion, horrible epidemics, and famines in place after place. This is how the first contractions and birth pains of the new age will begin. Persecution of Believers You can expect to be persecuted, even killed, for you will be hated by all the nations because of your love for me. Then many will stop following me and fall away, and they will betray one another and hate one another. And many lying prophets will arise, deceiving multitudes and leading them away from the path of truth. There will be such an increase of sin and lawlessness that those whose hearts once burned with passion for God and others will grow cold. But keep your hope to the end and you will experience life and deliverance. Yet through it all, this joyful assurance of the realm of heaven's kingdom 
will be proclaimed all over the world, providing every nation with a demonstration of the reality of God. And after this, the end of this age will arrive. The detestable idol that brings misery. When you witness what Daniel prophesied, the disgusting destroyer taking its stand in the holy place, let the reader learn. Then those in the land of Judah must escape to the higher ground. On that day, if you happen to be outside, don't go back inside to gather belongings. And if you're working out in the field, don't run back home to get a coat. It will be especially hard for pregnant women and for those nursing their babies in those days. So pray that your escape will not be during the winter months or on a Sabbath, for this will be a time of great misery beyond the magnitude of anything the world has ever seen or ever will see. Unless God limited those days, no one would escape. But because of his love for those chosen to be his, he will shorten that time of trouble. And you will hear reports from some saying, Look, he has returned. The Messiah is over here, or the Messiah is over there. Don't believe it. For there will be impostors falsely claiming to be God's anointed one, and false prophets will arise to perform miracle signs to lead astray, if possible, those God has chosen to be his. But remember this, for I prophesy it will happen. So if someone says to you, Look, the anointed one has returned. He's in the desert. Don't go chasing after him. Or if they say to you, Look, he's in our house. Don't believe it. The appearing of the Son of Man will burst forth with the brightness of a lightning strike that shines from one end of the sky to the other, illuminating the earth. How do birds of prey know where the dead body is? They just know instinctively. And so you will know when I appear. The Appearing of the Son of Man Then immediately, this is what will take place. The sun will be darkened, and the moon will give no light. The stars will fall from the sky, and all the cosmic powers will be shaken. Then the sign announcing the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn over him. And they will see the Son of Man appearing in the clouds of heaven, revealed with mighty power, great splendor, and glory. And he will send his messengers with the loud blast of the trumpet, and with a great voice they will gather his beloved chosen ones by the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. A Parable of the Fig Tree Now learn the lesson from the parable of the fig tree. When spring arrives and it sends out its tender branches and sprouts leaves, you know that ripe fruit is soon to appear. So it will be with you. For when you observe all these things taking place, you will know that he is near, even at the door. I assure you, the end of this age will not come until all I have spoken comes to pass. The earth and the sky will wear out and fade away before one word I speak loses its power or fails to accomplish its purpose. Live always ready for his appearing. Concerning that day and exact hour, no one knows when it will arrive. Not even the angels of heaven. Only the Father knows. For it will be exactly like it was in the days of Noah when the Son of Man appears. Before the flood, people lived their lives eating, drinking, marrying, and having children. They didn't realize the end was near until Noah entered the ark. And then suddenly, the flood came and took them all away in judgment. It will happen the same way when the Son of Man appears. At that time, two men will be working on the farm. One will be taken away in judgment, the other left. 
two women will be grinding grain. One will be taken away in judgment, the other left. This is why you must stay alert, because no one knows the day your Lord will come. But realize this, if a homeowner had known what time of night the burglar would come to rob his house, he would have been alert and ready and not let his house be robbed. So always be ready, alert, and prepared, because at an hour when you're not expecting him, the Son of Man will come. The Wise and Faithful Servant Who is the one qualified to oversee the master's house? He will be a reliable servant who is wise and faithful, one he can depend on. The master will want to give him the responsibility of overseeing others in his house, for his servant will lead them well and give them food at the right time. What joy and blessing will come to that faithful servant when the master comes home to find him serving with excellence? I can promise you, the master will raise him up and put him in charge of all that he owns. But the evil servant says in his heart, My master delays his coming, and who knows when he'll return? And because of the delay, the servant mistreats those in his master's household. Instead of caring for the ones he was appointed to serve, he abuses the other servants and gives himself over to eating and drinking with drunkards. Let me tell you what will happen to him. His master will suddenly return at a time that surprises him and he will remove the abusive, selfish servant from his position of trust. And the master will cut him in two and assign him to the place of great sorrow and anguish along with all the other pretenders and unbelievers. Matthew chapter 25 A parable about ten virgins At the time my coming draws near, Heaven's kingdom realm can be compared to ten maidens who took their oil lamps and went outside to meet the bridegroom and his bride. Five of them were foolish and ill-prepared, for they took no extra oil for their lamps. Five of them were wise and sensible, for they took flasks of olive oil with their lamps. When the bridegroom didn't come when they expected, they all grew drowsy and fell asleep. Then suddenly, in the middle of the night, they were awakened by the shout, Get up! The bridegroom is here! Come out and have an encounter with him! So all the girls got up and trimmed their lamps. But the foolish ones were running out of oil. So they said to the five wise ones, Share your oil with us, because our lamps are going out. We can't, they replied. We don't have enough for all of us. You'll have to go and buy some for yourselves. While the five girls were out buying oil, the bridegroom appeared. Those who were ready and waiting were escorted inside with him and the wedding party to enjoy the feast. And then the door was locked. Later, the five foolish girls came running up to the door and pleaded, Lord, Lord, let us come in. But he called back, Go away. Do I know you? I can assure you, I don't even know you. That is the reason you should always stay awake and be alert, because you don't know the day or hour when the bridegroom will appear. A parable about financial stewardship. Again, heaven's kingdom realm is like the wealthy man who went on a long journey and summoned all his trusted servants and assigned his financial management over to them. Before he left on his journey, he entrusted a bag of 5,000 gold coins to one of his servants, to another a bag of 2,000 gold coins, and to the third a bag of 1,000 gold coins, each according to his ability to manage. The one entrusted with 5,000 gold coins immediately went out and traded with the money, and he doubled his investment. In the same way, the one who was entrusted with 2,000 gold coins traded with the sum and likewise doubled his investment. But the one who had been entrusted with 1,000 gold coins dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. 
After much time had passed, the master returned to settle accounts with his servants. The one who was entrusted with five thousand gold coins came and brought ten thousand, saying, See, I have doubled your money. Commending his servant, the master replied, You have done well, and proven yourself to be my loyal and trustworthy servant. Because you have been a faithful steward to manage a small sum, now I will put you in charge of much, much more. You will experience the delight of your master, who will say to you, Come, celebrate with me. Then the one who had been entrusted with two thousand gold coins came in and said, See, my master, I have double what you have entrusted to me. Commending his servant, the master replied, You have done well, and proven yourself to be my loyal and trustworthy servant. Because you were faithful to manage a small sum, now I will put you in charge of much, much more. You will experience the delight of your master who will say to you, Come, celebrate with me. Then the one who had been entrusted with one thousand gold coins came to his master and said, Look, sir, I know that you are a hard man to please, and you're a shrewd and ruthless businessman who grows rich on the backs of others. I was afraid of you, so I went and hid your money and buried it in the ground. But here it is. Take it. It's yours. Angered by what he heard, the master said to him, You're an untrustworthy and lazy servant. If you knew I was a shrewd and ruthless businessman who always makes a profit, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? Then I would have received it all back with interest when I returned. But because you were unfaithful, I will take the one thousand gold coins and give them to the one who has ten thousand. For the one who has will be given more until he overflows with abundance. And the one with hardly anything, even what little he has, will be taken from him. Then the master said to his other servants, Now throw that good-for-nothing servant far away from me into the outer darkness, where there will be great misery and anguish. The Judgment of the Multitudes When the Son of Man appears in his majestic glory with all his angels by his side, he will take his seat on the throne of splendor, and all the nations will be gathered together before him. And like a shepherd who separates the sheep from the goats, he will separate all the people. The sheep he will put on his right side, and the goats on his left. Then the king will turn to those on his right and say, You have a special place in my father's heart. Come and experience the full inheritance of the kingdom realm that has been destined for you from before the foundation of the world. For when you saw me hungry, you fed me. When you found me thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And when I had no place to stay, you invited me in. And when I was poorly clothed, you covered me. When I was sick, you tenderly cared for me. And when I was in prison, you visited me. Then the godly will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty and give you food and something to drink? When did we see you with no place to stay and invite you in? When did we see you poorly clothed and cover you? When did we see you sick and tenderly cared for you or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Don't you know? When you cared for the one of the least important of these, my little ones, my true brothers and sisters, you demonstrated love for me. Then those on his left, the king will say, Leave me, for you are under the curse of eternal fire that has been destined for the devil and all his demons. For when you saw me hungry, you refused to give me food. And when you saw me thirsty, you refused to give me something to drink. I had no place to stay, and you refused to take me in as your guest. 
When you saw me poorly clothed, you closed your hearts and would not cover me. When you saw that I was sick, you didn't lift a finger to help me. And when I was imprisoned, you never came to visit me. And then those on his left will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty and not give you food or something to drink? When did we see you homeless or poorly clothed? When did we see you sick and not help you or in prison and not visit you? Then he will answer them, Don't you know? When you refuse to help one of the least important among these my little ones, my true brothers and sisters, you refuse to help and honor me. And they will depart from his presence and go into eternal punishment. But the godly and beloved sheep will enter into eternal bliss. Matthew chapter 26 Jesus prophesies his crucifixion. After Jesus had completed his teachings, he said to his disciples, You know that the feast of the Passover begins in two more days. That's when the Son of Man is to be betrayed and handed over to be crucified. Meanwhile, the prominent priests and religious leaders of the nation were gathered in the palace of the high priest, Caiaphas. That's when they made their decision to secretly have Jesus captured and killed. But they all agreed, we can't do this during the Passover celebrations or we could have a riot on our hands. A woman anoints Jesus. Then Jesus went to Bethany, to the home of Simon, a man Jesus had healed of leprosy. A woman came into the house holding an alabaster flask filled with fragrant and expensive oil. She walked right up to Jesus and in a lavish gesture of devotion, she poured out the costly oil and it cascaded over his head as he was at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were offended. What a total waste, they grumbled. We could have sold it for a great deal of money and given it to the poor. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Why are you so critical of this woman? She's done a beautiful act of kindness for me. You will always have someone poor whom you can help, but you will not always have me. When she poured the fragrant oil over me, she was preparing my body for burial. I promise you that as this wonderful gospel spreads all over the world, the story of her lavish devotion to me will be also remembered in memory of her. Judas agrees to betray Jesus. One of the twelve apostles, Judas the locksmith, went to the leading priests and said, How much are you willing to pay me to betray Jesus into your hands? They agreed to pay him 30 silver coins. Immediately, Judas began to scheme and look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Jesus celebrates Passover with his disciples. On the first day of Passover, the day when any bread made with yeast was removed from every Jewish home, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where shall we prepare the Passover meal for you? He answered them, My heart longs with great desire to eat this Passover meal with you. Go into Jerusalem, and you will encounter a man. Tell him that the teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am coming to your home to eat the Passover meal with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus had instructed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When evening came, he took his place at the table and dined with the twelve. While they were eating, Jesus spoke up and said, One of you is about to betray me. Feeling deeply hurt by these words, one after another asked him, You don't mean me, do you? He answered, 
It is one who has shared meals with me as an intimate friend. All that was prophesied of me will take place. But how miserable it would be for the one who betrays the Son of Man. It would be far better for him if he had never been born. Then finally, Judas the traitor spoke up and asked him, Teacher, perhaps it is I? Jesus answered, You said it. The Lord's Supper As they ate, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said to them, This is my body. Eat it. Then taking the cup of wine and giving praises to the Father, he entered into covenant with them, saying, This is my blood. Each of you must drink it in fulfillment of the covenant. For this is the blood that seals the new covenant. It will be poured out for many for the complete forgiveness of sins. The next time we drink this, I will be with you, and we will drink it together with a new understanding in the kingdom realm of my Father. Then they sang a psalm and left for the Mount of Olives. Jesus prophesies Peter's denial. Along the way, Jesus said to them, Before the night is over, you will all desert me. This will fulfill the prophecy of the scripture that says, I will strike down the shepherd, and all the sheep will scatter far and wide. But after I am risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee, and will meet you there. Then Peter spoke up and said, Even if all the rest lose their faith and fall away, I will still be beside you, Jesus. Are you sure, Peter? Jesus said, in fact, before the rooster crows a few hours from now, you will have denied me three times. Peter replied, I, I absolutely will never deny you, even if I have to die with you. And all the others said the same thing. Jesus prays in Gethsemane. Then Jesus led his disciples to an orchard called the oil press. He told them, sit here while I go and pray over there. He took Peter, Jacob, and John with him. However, an intense feeling of great sorrow plunged his soul into deep sorrow and agony. And he said to them, my heart is overwhelmed and crushed with grief. Feels as though I'm dying. Stay here and keep watch with me. Then he walked a short distance away, and overcome with grief, he threw himself face down on the ground and prayed, My father, if there's a way, any way you can deliver me from this suffering, please take it from me. Yet what I want is not important, for I only desire to fulfill your plan for me. And then an angel from heaven appeared to strengthen him. Later, he came back to his three disciples and found them all asleep. He awakened Peter and said to him, Do you lack the strength to stay awake with me even for just an hour? Keep alert and pray that you'll be spared from this time of testing. You should have learned by now that your spirit is eager enough, but your humanity is weak. Then he left them for a second time to pray in solitude. He said to God, My father, if there is not a way that you can deliver me from this suffering, then your will must be done. He came back to the disciples and found them sound asleep, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. 
So he left them and went away to pray the same prayer for the third time. When he returned again to his disciples, he awoke them, saying, Are you still sleeping and resting? Don't you know the hour has come for the Son of Man to be handed over to the authority of sinful men? Get up and let's go, for the betrayer has arrived. The Betrayal and Arrest of Jesus At that moment, Judas, his once trusted disciple, appeared along with a large crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent to arrest Jesus by order of the ruling priests and Jewish religious leaders. Now, Judas was the traitor. He arranged to give them a signal that would identify Jesus, for he had told them, Jesus is the one whom I will kiss, so grab him. Judas quickly stepped up to Jesus and said, Shalom, Rabbi. And he kissed him on both cheeks. My beloved friend, Jesus said, Is this why you've come? Then the armed men seized Jesus to arrest him. But one of the disciples pulled out a dagger and swung it at the servant of the high priest, slashing off his ear. Jesus said to him, Put your dagger away! For all those who embrace violence will die by violence. Don't you realize that I could ask my heavenly Father for angels to come at any time to deliver me? And instantly he would answer me by sending twelve armies of the angelic host to come and protect us. But that would thwart the prophetic plan of God, for it has been written that it would happen this way. Then Jesus turned to the mob and said, why would you arrest me with swords and clubs as though I were an outlaw? Day after day I sat in the temple courts with you, teaching the people, yet you didn't arrest me. But all of this fulfills the prophecies of the scriptures. At that point, all of his disciples ran away and abandoned him. Jesus is condemned by the religious leaders. Those who arrested Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the chief priest, and to a meeting where the religious scholars and the Supreme Jewish Council were already assembled. Now, Peter had followed the mob from a distance, all the way to the chief priest's courtyard. And after entering, he sat with the servants of the chief priest, who had gathered there, wanting to see how things would unfold. The chief priests and the entire Supreme Jewish Council of Leaders were doing their best to find false charges that they could bring against Jesus because they were looking for a reason to put him to death. Many false witnesses came forward, but the evidence could not be corroborated. Finally, two men came forward and declared, This man said, I can destroy God's temple and build it again in three days. Then the chief priest stood up and said to Jesus, have you nothing to say about these allegations? Is what they're saying about you true? But Jesus remained silent before them. So the chief priest said to him, I charge you under oath in the name of the living God. Tell us once and for all if you are the anointed Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus answered him, You just said it yourself. And more than that, you are about to see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God the Almighty. And one day, you will also see the Son of Man coming in the heavenly clouds. This infuriated the chief priests. And as an act of outrage, he tore his robe and shouted, What blasphemy! No more witnesses are needed. You heard this grievous blasphemy. Turning to the council, he said, now what is your verdict? He's guilty and deserves the death penalty, they answered. Then they spat on his face and slapped him. Others struck him over and over with their fists. Then they taunted him by saying, Oh, anointed one, prophesy to us. Tell us which one of us is about to hit you next. 
Peter's denials. Meanwhile, Peter was still sitting outside in the courtyard when a servant girl came up to him and said, I recognize you. You are with Jesus the Galilean. In front of everyone, Peter denied it and said, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Later, as he stood near the gateway of the courtyard, another servant girl noticed him and said, I know this man is a follower of Jesus the Nazarene. Once again, Peter denied it, and with an oath he said, I tell you, I don't know the man. A short time later, those standing nearby approached Peter and said, We know you're one of his disciples. We can tell by your speech. Your Galilean accent gives you away. Peter denied it, and using profanity, he said, I don't know the man. At that very moment, the sound of a crowing rooster pierced the night. Then Peter remembered the prophecy of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. With a shattered heart, Peter went out of the courtyard, sobbing with bitter tears. Matthew chapter 27 Jesus condemned by the religious leaders Before the dawn that morning, all the chief priests and religious leaders resolved to take action against Jesus and decided that he should be executed. So they bound him with chains and led him away to Pilate, the Roman governor. Judas commits suicide. Now, when Judas the betrayer saw that Jesus had been sentenced to death, remorse filled his heart. He returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and religious leaders, saying, I have sinned because I have betrayed an innocent man. They replied, Why are you bothering us? That's your problem. Then Judas flung the silver coins inside the temple and went out and hanged himself. The chief priests, picking up the pieces of silver, said, We can't keep this, for it's unlawful to put blood money into the temple treasury. So after some deliberation, they decided to purchase the potter's field of clay to use as a cemetery for burying strangers. That's why the land has been called the Field of Blood. This fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah. They took the thirty pieces of silver, the price at which he was valued by the people of Israel, the price of a precious man, and with the silver they bought the potter's field as the Lord directed. Jesus brought before Pilate. As Jesus stood in front of the Roman governor, Pilate asked him, So, you are really the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, You have spoken it. Then he was slandered and accused by the chief priests and religious leaders, but he remained silent. Pilate said, Don't you hear these allegations? But Jesus offered no defense to any of the charges, much to the great astonishment of Pilate. Now, every year at Passover, it was the custom of the governor to pardon a prisoner and release him to the people, anyone they wanted. And at that time, Pilate was holding in custody a notorious criminal named Jesus Barabbas. So as the crowds of people assembled outside of Pilate's residence, he went out and offered them a choice. He asked them, Who would you want me to release to you today? Jesus who is called Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Anointed One? Now, Pilate was fully aware that the religious leaders had handed Jesus over to him because of their bitter jealousy. Just then, as Pilate was presiding over the tribunal, his wife sent him an urgent message. Don't harm that holy man, for I suffered a horrible nightmare last night about him. Meanwhile, the chief priest, 
and the religious leaders were inciting the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be freed and to have Jesus killed. So Pilate asked them again, Which of the two men would you like me to release for you? They shouted, Barabbas! Pilate asked them, Then what would you have me to do with Jesus, who was called the Anointed One? They all shouted back, Crucify him! Why? Pilate asked. What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting out, Crucify him! Jesus condemned to death. When Pilate realized that a riot was about to break out and that it was useless to try to reason with the crowd, he sent for a basin of water. After washing his hands in front of the people, he said, I am innocent of the blood of this righteous man. The responsibility for his death is now yours. And the crowd replied, Let his blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas to the people. He ordered that Jesus be beaten with a whip made of leather straps embedded with metal and afterward be crucified. Then the guards took him into their military compound where a detachment of nearly 600 soldiers surrounded him. They stripped off his clothing and placed a scarlet robe on him to make fun of him. Then they braided a crown of thorns and set it on his head. After placing a reed staff in his right hand, they knelt down before him and irreverently mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they spat in his face and took the reed staff from his hand and hit him repeatedly on his head, driving the crown of thorns deep into his brow. When they finished ridiculing him, they took off the scarlet robe and put his own clothes back on him and led him away to be crucified. And as they came out of the city, they stopped an African man named Simon from Libya and compelled him to carry the cross for Jesus. The Crucifixion They brought Jesus to Golgotha, which means Skull Hill. And there the soldiers offered him a mild painkiller a drink of wine mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Then they crucified Jesus, nailing his hands and feet to the cross. The soldiers divided his clothing among themselves by rolling dice to see who would win them, and the soldiers stood there to watch what would happen and to keep guard over him. Above his head, they placed a sign that read, This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of Israel. Two criminals were also crucified with Jesus, one on each side of him. And those who passed by shook their heads and spitefully ridiculed him, saying, We heard you boast that you could destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Why don't you save yourself now? If you're really God's son, come down from the cross. Even the ruling priests with the Jewish scholars and religious leaders joined in the mockery and kept on saying, he saved others, but he can't even save himself. Israel's king, is he? He should pull out the nails and come down from the cross right now. Then we'll believe in him. He says he puts all his trust in God. So let's see if it's true and see if God really wants to rescue his favored son. Even the two criminals who were crucified with Jesus began to taunt him, hurling their insults on him. The death of the Savior. For three hours, beginning at noon, darkness came over the earth. And at three o'clock, Jesus shouted with a mighty voice in Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? Some who were standing near the cross misunderstood and said, He's calling for Elijah. 
one bystander ran and got a sponge, soaked it with sour wine, then put it on a stick and held it up for Jesus to drink. But the rest said, Leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to rescue him. Jesus passionately cried out, took his last breath, and gave up his spirit. At that moment, the veil and the Holy of Holies was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook violently, rocks were splint apart, and graves were opened. Then many of the holy ones who had died were brought back to life and came out of the graves. And after Jesus' resurrection, they were plainly seen by many people walking in Jerusalem. Now, when the Roman military officer and his soldiers witnessed what was happening and felt the powerful earthquake, they were extremely terrified. They said, There is no doubt. This man was the Son of God. Watching from a distance were many of the women who had followed him from Galilee and given him support. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jacob and Joseph, and the mother of Jacob and John. The Burial of Jesus At the end of the day, a wealthy man named Joseph, a follower of Jesus from the village of Rama, approached Pilate and asked to have custody of the body of Jesus. So Pilate consented and ordered that the body be given to him. Then Joseph wrapped the body in a shroud of fine linen and placed it in his own unused tomb, which had only recently been cut into the rock. They rolled a large stone to seal the entrance of the tomb and left. Sitting across from the tomb were Mary Magdalene and the other Marys watching all that took place. The next day, the day after preparation day for Passover, the chief priests and the Pharisees went together to Pilate. They said to him, Our master, we remember that this impostor claimed that he would rise from the dead after three days. So please, order the tomb to be sealed until after the third day. Seal it so that his disciples can't come and steal the corpse and tell people he rose from the dead. Then the last deception would be worse than the first. I will send soldiers to guard the tomb, Pilate replied. Go with them and make the tomb as secure as possible. So they left and sealed the tomb, and Pilate's soldiers secured the tomb. Matthew chapter 28 the Resurrection of Jesus After the Sabbath ended, at the first light of dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to take a look at the tomb. Suddenly, the earth shook violently beneath their feet as the angel of the Lord Jehovah descended from heaven. Lightning flashed all around him and his robe was dazzling white. The guards were stunned and terrified, lying motionless like dead men. Then the angel walked up to the tomb, rolled away the stone, and sat on top of it. The women were breathless and terrified until the angel said to them, There's no reason to be afraid. I know you're here looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen victoriously, just as he said. Come inside the tomb and see the place where our Lord was lying. Then run and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. I give you this message. I am going ahead of you in Galilee, and you will see me there. They rushed quickly to tell his disciples, and their hearts were deep in wonder and filled with great joy. Along the way, Jesus suddenly appeared in front of them and said, Rejoice! They were so overwhelmed by seeing him that they bowed down and grasped his feet in adoring worship. Then Jesus said to them, Throw off all your fears. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. They will find me there. The guards report what they witnessed. After the women left the tomb, a few of the guards went into Jerusalem 
and told the chief priests everything they had seen and heard. So the chief priests called a meeting with all the religious leaders and came up with a plan. They bribed the guards with a large sum of money and told them, Tell everyone, while we were asleep, his disciples came at night and stole his body. If Pilate found, finds out about this, don't worry. We'll make sure you don't get blamed. So they took the money and did as they were told. This is why the story of the guards is still circulated among the Jews to this day. The Great Commission Meanwhile, the eleven disciples heard the wonderful news from the women and left for Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had arranged to meet them. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still had lingering doubts. Then Jesus came close to them and said, All the authority of the universe has been given to me. Now go in my authority and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to faithfully follow all that I have commanded you, and never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age.